Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2024 E4S Annual Summit. Let's start with a quick show of hands. Who's attending for the first time? First timers at the Annual Summit. Nice. See a lot of new faces here. OK, now, who's attending for the second time? OK, thank you for coming back. And now, who's attending for the third or more time? Well, we have a lot of veterans around here. That's cool. Whether you're a newcomer or a veteran, it's a great pleasure to have you all with us today. As you know, the annual summit is one of our flagship events. But really, for us, it's more than just an event. As we gather here, we bring the essence of E4S to life. Building communities is at the heart of what we do, and today is a great opportunity for us to connect, share, and grow together. But before we start, let's have a quick look at the agenda. So this afternoon will be split into two blocks. We'll start with the first block in sustainable finance regulation, which will feature a compelling panel of speakers moderated by our co-managing director, Florian Hoss. We'll end this block with a student intervention, so we'll have a master student who will come on stage to share his perspectives on this topic. After a short coffee break, we'll come back for a second block on purpose-driven governance. This time, we'll have three keynote speakers, followed by a Q&A session moderated by myself. Here again, we'll have a student come on stage to share her experiences related to this topic. Last but not least, we have two fantastic speakers that are going to join us for the closing, uh, which will be followed by a cocktail reception. Throughout the afternoon, you'll be able to ask questions and interact with us on stage through our platform SlideU. You can connect by scanning the QR code right here or going to www.sly.do with the hashtag annual summit. You can do it now, but don't worry, I'll show it again multiple times. I also invite you to tag us on your social media posts, either with our handles or with the hashtag E4S annual summit. And with that, please give a round of applause for our two co-managing directors, Jean-Philippe Bonardi and Michael Acklin. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for uh, being here. Um, I happen to be also one of the new faces here. I raised my hand when uh, uh, Jan asked about it. Um, and so, you know, I joined EPFL last summer, and the first thing I did is uh, get a better sense of the history and the trajectory of E4S. I like when I join a new organization is to understand a bit where it's coming from, where it's heading. And frankly, what I found was humbling. I thought what E4S had already achieved is quite remarkable. And I think there are three observations, three pieces of data that I think uh, confirm that. The, the first number that I want to share is uh, 30. And that's the number of recent projects funded by the, the center. And beyond the number of projects itself, I think what is remarkable is the quality and the new type of interactions that uh, these projects represent. It is col collaboration across the three institutions, EPFL, UNIL, and IMD. And it is also interactions with uh, industry, civil society, uh, and policymaking. And I think this is quite remarkable. The, the second number I want to share with you is more than 100. And that's the number of students who are currently enrolled or have graduated from our master's program in sustainability management and technology. And I was heartened to see that our students, the first cohort just graduated last September, did very well. And I think this is by blending and offering a unique mix of classes in technology, in economics, in management, in a way that really responds to the needs of tomorrow's economy and today's economy. And the last number is, that I want to share with you is 2,000. And that's the number of people who have attended events uh, organized or co-organized by, by E4S. And this ranges from small events with just a few dozen people who are all passionate about what they're doing, who really care deeply about a certain topic, whether it's circular economy, biodiversity, or food, to larger events like Showcase, the next one of which will take place next fall, um, or this annual summit. And for this, I'll let 
uh, my colleague talk more about that. I can't, cannot oh. take that. <laughs> well, uh, uh, as you can tell, it, 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 can, it can be hard to be a, a manager director of E4S, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> sometimes you have to accept the fact that you're going to be diminished, but... Uh, <laughs> No, extremely, extremely happy to, to be with you here. As Michael was saying, this annual summit is very, very important for us because this is a moment when we, we gather our people together, we exchange ideas, uh, and in a certain way, we take the pulse, right, of, uh, of what's going on the, in our community uh, and how uh, people uh, think about things and, and, how the, and which kind of ideas, you know, we want to push together. Um, uh, the, 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 the research, in fact, you know, has been really, really, when we created E4S, you know, four years ago, uh, Jean-Pierre Dantin was just, you know, here was really at the helm, and it was very, very clear that research was going to be one of the core, core driving force of everything that we were going to do, right? Of course, you know, to invent new things, but also to uh, uh, create new content, you know, for our master program, and also to try to find good ways uh, to innovate with our ecosystem. So research has always been the driving force. So we thought that actually, you know, I would take um, a few minutes now to uh, just say a little words about how, you know, these things has evolved over the last four years and where we are now and how it has led us, in fact, to this uh, annual summit today, right? Uh, so when we started um, uh, E4S four years ago, our prior was essentially twofold. I mean, the first was that we were essentially uh, at the tipping point, that the world was at a tipping point. Uh, and that uh, this tipping point was essentially driven by two major, major factors. One was something that probably, you know, is very, very keen, is very, very important for many of you in this room, which is, you know, the, the environmental and the climate challenge, right? This climate challenge is going to be or uh, is going to be something that is going to change massively how we do many, many things, how we consume, how we produce, right? And in order to be able to stay within planetary boundaries. Right. So that, that's the first thing that essentially is really, really at the core, uh, was, was, a, was a core belief that we needed to do something about that. The second core belief was that there was also uh, a technological revolution going on, which would present probably some, some, uh, some important um, assets in order to meet, in fact, some of the environmental challenges that I was talking about, you know, in a minute, but that this technology, um, uh, this technology revolution was potentially creating many challenges as well, right? And so the, the, the real beginning of E4S was to say, look, we need to put these two things together. We need to find a way to contribute to coming up with some options to face the environmental challenge by leveraging as well as possible, you know, what we can do on the technology side, right? And from there, it was very, very clear that, you know, uh, bringing it to the, our three institutions together, UNIL, APFL, and IMD, uh, would be very, very fruitful because it would, uh, it would allow us to essentially extend the boundaries, uh, uh, think a little bit out, more out of the box, and integrate some of these technological and innovation aspects with uh, what we're doing in economics, in management, and therefore that uh, it would be a very, very fruitful thing. And in a, in a way, you know, this is this belief that has carried us over the last four years, right? A lot of very, very interesting projects that actually uh, Michael mentioned already uh, related to, of course, you know, uh, how do we develop a circular economy, you know, and, 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 and how can technology help to do that? Uh, uh, how, do we, um, how do we push the energy transition? Uh, how do we consider biodiversity and how do we solve some of these problems? So a lot of that is, in fact, the research that is currently going on and in which I think, you know, we are, uh, we're, we're putting people together, we're making some great progress on many, many things and a lot of interesting stuff is being developed there, right, in an inter interdisciplinary way. Now, our thinking has slightly evolved, I would say, uh, over the last four years on this uh, uh, from, from a slightly different perspective, which is that what we have realized is that beyond, you know, this complementarity between, you know, the, the let's say, the, the solutions to the, to, the, to the environmental challenge and what the technology could do, uh, we were facing something or we are facing something that is actually of a very, very significant magnitude and that we could not or we cannot leave on the side. And this thing is actually a, a real institutional crisis, a crisis of the legitimacy of the institutions uh, in which we are, uh, with which we are operating. And when I say that, you know, we cannot take that lightly because that's essentially the glue, right, that can 
keep, that can keep a system together, that can make a system work. So we really, we, we started thinking that we really needed to work on that, you know, and that this was something that was going to be a very, very important part of uh, an, an agenda of, uh, of an institution like E4S. And so we started working on that, you know, more and more. And the more we were working on that, the more we identified a few um, refine the challenges, I would say, right, of what, what it means. One of these challenges very, very clearly at the moment, and that, that is a, a very big legitimacy challenge in a certain way, is the measurement challenge. We need to find a way to have a common way to measure things. If we don't, and if we still want to keep some aspect of a, of a market economy, it's actually very, very difficult to do things. Right? So we need to have some common basis for you know, how this type of measurement works and, and, and how this is produced. And so we will see that this is, of course, at the core of what we do now at E4S. And this will be, in fact, a key aspect of the first round table that, we'll, uh, that we will have you know, right after. The second uh, uh, legitimacy challenge that basically you know, uh, struck us and that you know, we think is extremely important is what I would call an organizational challenge. In a market economy, again, uh, when you have uh, entrepreneurs and companies are there to, in fact, innovate, bring new ideas, sometimes also bring the cost of these new ideas down so that everybody can benefit, right? And in, 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 from that perspective, again, firms and entrepreneurs have been a very legitimate way of doing many, many things. The problem that we have now is that some of those aspects uh, are being questioned. And in particular, the fact that a lot of these uh, companies and, and, and even entrepreneurial venture are driven uh, uh, you know, significantly or in a significant amount by profits. And so there we also need probably to find some sort of a response right, uh, to this. And we need to wonder about how the system can adapt. Right? And this will be the, the purpose of the second uh, round table that we will have in a minute when you know, we will explore one possibility to make it happen, which is essentially to move towards purpose-based organizations uh, and purpose-based type of governance. Right? That would be the last one. And you'll see that in the last, um, in the last discussion or the last presentation with Pascal Dupas, we will, in a way, close the loop on this legitimacy thing by uh, exploring the concept of what can be a just transition. So all these things are very, very important topic, we believe. We believe they are very, very complementary to a lot of the things that we've been doing before. But those are really, really some of the things that animate us at the moment. And we're really looking forward to discussing uh, them with all of you. So let's see. Let's, let's enjoy the day. Uh, and uh, let's have a great afternoon together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael and Jean-Philippe. In a few minutes, we'll open our first panel with Christoph Baumann, Envoy for Sustainable Finance at the Swiss State Secretariat for International Finance, Caroline Bridges, Technical Director at the IFRS Foundation, David Bastia Yarosh, member of the EU Platform on Sustainable Finance, and it will be moderated by our co-managing director and professor at IMD, Florian Hoss. But before that, we'll welcome on stage my colleague, Alisa Gessler, who will give you a short introduction to the key concepts of sustainability reporting so that everyone is on the same page. So please welcome all these amazing people now on stage. Good afternoon, and welcome to this panel on sustainable finance regulation, or more precisely, sustainability reporting. I will try my best to give you a short introduction to this highly complex topic, uh, so that we all have a bit of an idea what this is about. So far, the landscape of sustainability disclosures has been quite fragmented. Companies could decide what information on sustainability to pu publish, and according to which framework. Now. This, of course, has led to quite some cherry picking as well. What we see now is that it's been consolidated into two major set of mandatory sustainability reporting standards. We have two major players. On the one side, there's the European Union with the CSRD and the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, and the ESRS, the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, which specify what exactly needs to be reported under the CSRD. 
On the other side, the other major player is the IFRS, the foundation, the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation. And it's really aiming to cover the rest of the world. Um, it has also issued sustainability standards. There's been a lot of talk about harmonization and so-called interoperability. And the aim is really to bring those two closer together so that companies don't have to report double. Materiality is a criterion according to which companies know what to publish, so which information is considered relevant under the respective standard. The materiality definitions between the IFRS and the European definition still differ a bit, although we'll hear more later about how we're moving more towards harmonization. So the IFRS, is important to know, has historically been issuing financial reporting standards. So it's really focused on information that investors need, information that is relevant to investors for decision making. And therefore, we see this little picture. So it's about financial risk and financial impact relevant um, to business. On the other hand, we have the European Union, and it's a political body. So it's covering or trying to cover more stakeholders than investors, in particular people and the planet. And therefore, in the EU, what's very much emphasized is that also non-financially relevant impacts of business need to be reported and, uh, and are relevant information. It's very confusing, I know. We'll learn more about this. <laughs> and, uh, and you all have time afterwards also to keep learning on this topic. Now, 2024, it's an exciting year. It's a landmark year for sustainability reporting. Because so far, financial statements had to be published. Now, from this year on, CEOs all over the world, or C-level executives, will have to sign sustainability reports. And they're personally liable. And not only companies that have to report on sustainability by law will have to think about this and be impacted by this, but also smaller companies will be required to, to, uh, to um, provide data across supply chains. So it's really huge. And Switzerland is kind of in between these two major players, the IFRS and the EU, and will have to think whether to adopt the IFRS sustainability standards or the European ones, or maybe both in the long term. We're honored today to have the different perspectives represented here with our panel, and we're very much looking forward to learning more. And uh, now please allow me to hand over to Florian Hoos, Professor of Sustainability and ESG Accounting at IMD, and also Co-Managing Director at IFRS. Thank you. So thank you, Alisa, for a great introduction to what some people call a new era of corporate reporting. We are going to include the environment, the social, and the governance. We standardize and we quantify. And welcome to our panelists. Welcome, Christoph. Welcome, Caroline. Welcome, David. We are extremely delighted to have you and to actually shed some light on the development of the standards, the adoption, and perhaps we also try to look a little bit into the crystal ball, um, what's coming up as the next big thing during the panel. So we agreed that we're going to give everybody uh, three minutes for a short introduction of the person and the institution that they represent. And my suggestion is we start with the person that had the longest way to come here. So welcome, Caroline, from the UK. Um, and please introduce yourself and your institution. Is this on? Hello. Oh. Uh, good afternoon. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for inviting me to come along and be part of this panel. As a technical director at the IFRS Foundation, it's important that we get out and meet all of you because we need to hear from you to help us do our work. And it's a symbiotic relationship. We're codependent on each other. So I am a technical director at the IFRS Foundation, but specifically I am part of the ISSB, or the International Sustainability Standards Board. Now, my background is as an accountant. I trained as an accountant many, many, many years ago. And <clears throat> then I became an academic and was teaching accounting and then sustainability because that's where I believed the future was in terms of where we needed to go next. I felt that accounting standards had got to some way, but my research really wanted said that we needed to go beyond that, uh, which is... But then I ended up <laughs> in London at the... Um, as part of the integrated International Integrated Reporting Council. I was working there, which is where my research interests were. 
And somehow or other, I've now ended up working for the IFRS Foundation. Now, you've already seen on this schematic just there that the uh, ISSB is a group of these frameworks that have come together. Now, why, why is that? So 2019, the IFRS Foundation was called upon to think about setting up a sustainability standards board. And why? Well, part of the reason was we obviously had the, the demand for more and regulated and standardized information, but it's to do with the structure of the foundation and the due process, which is very kind of regulated, regimented in the way that the foundation is run. And that comes on to some of your questions that you want to know about how we set standards. And it was felt that the, the foundation was, was a good home for that. And it took the two years while I was working in London for all these organizations to come together. And they came together for the greater good. So that's SASB, CDSB, um, not GRI, who has stayed as a separate organization, as we know, because of their stakeholder, wider stakeholder reach. But they all came together and gave up their individuality for the greater good. And I think that was important. And it's part of the reason that the people that I now work with in London, we are very committed to move forward. And we'll talk later about how exactly we're going to do that. So I'm trying to limit myself to the three minutes. So hopefully that's not too long. OK, thank you. Thank you, Caroline. And then I think we have Brussels as the uh, second furthest destination. So welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Florian, and thank you to E4S uh, for, uh, for, for having me. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great panel and very important topic to, um, to be in. Let me start by introducing myself. Um, I, I'm wearing a lot of hats, but the hat that I'm wearing today is, is partially academic with Center for Finance and Development from the Graduate Institute, uh, but also a member of the Platform on Sustainable Finance. And I think, I think that, that, that Caroline s supplied us with a lot of acronyms already, so, so I'll try not to, not to <laughs> add to that, to that soup and really simplify things. The body that I'm, um, that I'm uh, w working with, which is called Platform on Sustainable Finance, it's a, uh, it's, it's a body advising European Commission on the sustainable finance reform. And what we are trying to achieve there is quite simple. Recognizing what um, Jean-Philippe said, lack of normalization, standardization, and in fact a failure of ESG framework drove the European Commission and, and people working in finance in all the financial institutions and industry to come together and try to get it right, which basically comes down to introducing a classification, a system of definitions of what is a sustainable economic activity for each and every sector. And using that, those definitions, and ask, ask, force companies to start reporting how much of their revenue is aligned with those standards, how much of the revenue is sustainable. And taking that data and asking all financial market participants to start telling us how much money are invested in sustainable assets versus non-sustainable assets. So simple on paper, completely not simple in, uh, in practice. And I think that this is what we're going to be talking about today, and I'm really excited. So, Christoph. So I realize I didn't have the longest uh, travel time here, but I have the longest title. So as <laughs> Envoy for Sustainable Finance at the Swiss State Secretary for International Finance, um, I'm responsible on one hand for the international representation of Switzerland in these uh, various sustainability forums, um, especially the G20 Sustainable <coughs> Finance Working Group, the International Platform Sustainable Finance, not to be confused with the platform for uh, the European Platform for Sustainable Finance, although both are hosted by the, by the European Commission. Um, and various other forms. But I'm also in charge with my teams to implement, uh, to define the Swiss strategy on sustainable finance and to implement it on the regulatory and on, on various other sites as well and voluntary together with the market. And I would say the one defining um, milestone of the last years, or multiple actually, the one has been the, in a, the 
putting into force of the climate and innovation law by the Swiss population last summer, which makes Switzerland, to my knowledge, the first country where the net zero goal by 2050 has been supported by the entire, has been voted on by the entire population. The second thing that makes it unique is it's the only country, I believe, where each and every company has to be, has a mandate to be net zero by 2050. So it's not just an obligation by, uh, for the government. And the third aspect which makes it unique and which makes my job very difficult, it kind of tells the government to ensure that the financial sector uh, plays an important part in combating climate change. So that's obviously the question, how do we ensure that? And I think one of the key ways to ensure that is to have the key uh, framework conditions in place that facilitate to, that transition for the financial market. And one of the main uh, ones is making disclosures in the cor um, corporate world mandatory, for especially for larger companies. Um, we've been one of the first countries worldwide who made TCFD um, disclosures, so the, uh, the recommendations of the Task Force of Climate Related Financial Disclosures mandatory. Um, before the ISSB has developed its uh, standards, before EFAC has developed its standards, we are now thinking of how to adjust to the to the new world, and that's part of the questions we come to later. Um, but it's it's a very, very exciting times. But I also want to say, this year is also the time of the pushback. So when you look at G20, it's under Brazilian presidency. It's all about how to not have SMEs, in, especially in emerging market countries, suffer under the regulatory burdens imposed um, to big companies in Europe. So that's a big topic in the emerging market, which we now have to deal with as well, which is important, and we need to build a stance on it. Thanks. Wonderful. So I'm, go I'm going to dive into the first field that is probably the biggest debate in the press and also for some academics, which is financial materiality, double materiality. So there is this perception that um, the European Union takes double materiality. We are concerned about investors and delivering good data to investors, but we are also concerned about measuring a lot of impact above this. Financial materiality in the press is sometimes presented as, well, we are just delivering high-quality data to investors, and that's what we care the most about. And so my first question would be, should we be worried that in a couple of years we have reporting the European way and reporting for the rest of the world, which might be the last thing that we want as investors? So how concerned are we about two different um, types of reporting? And I'll probably, I probably, I look in your eyes, who wants to tackle this question first? <laughs> I, w I would go uh, with Caroline first. Um. She is. Um. <laughs> so the, the foundation has been accused of this focus on financial materiality, and that is true. We have taken the same definition of materiality as we have for financial reporting, because that makes sense. It's one foundation. We should have the same definition. How that is going to be applied for sustainability-related risks and opportunities is still something that's going to be worked out. We only have one standard on climate, and the rest is what we call the general-related general, <coughs> general uh, related sustainability related risks and opportunities. In the press, as you say, it has been seen as being going to result in completely different information being disclosed for uh, as opposed to double materiality. Now, part of my role at the foundation is to, we are an observer at something called the Impact Management Platform. And they are the groups of impact investors, preparers, OECD, and so on. And of course, they have the perspective on impact, which is what you might call double materiality. And in the meetings that I've had with them, and when we talk long and hard, we find it difficult to find that boundary. What is that boundary between financial materiality and double materiality? We don't think that that is simple. We don't think that that is something that you can define. Now, I, I'm, I can't speak for the EU in how that's going to be assessed. How do you assess that this is, this is double materiality and this is financial materiality? Uh, because in... in the world of the IFRS Foundation, we also want that information to be connected to financial information. 
And some of it's to do with that time frame. Are we talking about the short term, medium term, or the long term? And in the long term, it seems to me that most sustainability related risks and opportunities are going to be financially material. And therefore, we should be reporting on them. If we use a particular discount factor, we may find out that it then becomes not material, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't then be reporting on it. <coughs> I think, is that a very confusing answer to a <laughs> confusing so, uh, question? Um, yeah, I, 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 I might leave it like that for the second. Is that all right? Yeah, and I'm, I'm hearing it's a lot in the application phase when companies start to report on financial and double match reality that we might learn something about it. But I, what's, I agree. But what's the, the European Union perspective, David? Florian, so, so <laughs> <laughs> you see, we, we, are, we are really talking about a surgery on an open organism. As we sit here, I skipped the plenary meeting in Brussels for this. So that's, that's how I value this, uh, this crowd. But as we speak, this discussion is going on in a lot of rooms in, uh, in Brussels. And putting aside a changing political environment and sentiment uh, um, about uh, which Christoph um, has, has mentioned, pu putting that aside, I believe that the discussion is between two um, uh, polar uh, uh, opposites. One says everything is material and you need to report on every variable um, that uh, the regulation uh, is uh, asking you. Versus, uh, and we, we could say that this is much more like NGO pool and environmentalist pool, versus the industry pool saying that only few things are material and let's make it voluntary, right? I would say that the, the stronger pull as, as it is now is towards if it's not material, you need to explain to the investor why in detail, right? If you keep filling in this variable and you say that this is not material for my company, explain to us why so that we have this information and we can assess if indeed this information is, um, is, is immaterial, right? So, so this, I would say, is uh, the discussion that we are talking about. But the, but the question that you ask is like, which approach will prevail, right? And I think that this is very interesting. And, 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 and also, uh, we are definitely, we could use, um, we could use Alisa's slide on, on really trying to understand how those standards are, are diverging into the uh, several, two, three, four uh, major approaches that, uh, and it will be role of Christoph and International Platform on Sustainable Finance to actually integrate them around the globe and make them recognizable across different regulations and, um, and different financial, um, financial markets. But I think that the best approach is like you do you, okay? And you do it right and take everything into consideration. That's why the EU's approach is based on what, uh, what, what Caroline is doing and, and the existing standards and they're trying to build something on, um, on top of it. But obviously, the larger the economy, the bigger the potential for spillover, right? So how much Swiss company can avoid uh, EU taxonomy reporting if their business is in Germany, France, and, um, and, and, and so on? how US company that is selling and has presence in Europe can avoid that. I don't think it can. Um, and I also think that using those non-financial reporting standards creates actually opportunities for companies outside of the EU, but we will talk about it in, a, in the next one. So Christoph, um, great position for Switzerland to be in, in a kind of sandwich position between the two standards. How do you I'm see super it? relaxed and I wouldn't call <laughs> ISSP a standard and I know this is now controversial but um, so I'm very relaxed about this topic and the reason for that is when you look at the support or um, the diplomatic support over time so ISSP has had tremendously important and um, widespread support for its creation and also for its standards and the G20 welcomed it, the G7 supported it as a global baseline. 
And that's the keyword. It's not a standard. It's a global baseline standard. So that now FROC, DSRS are using that baseline and using a double materiality layer on top of that, that's work as intended. It's not something controversial. If, if at any point that wasn't as intended, the EU, EU would stop supporting ISSB. If at any point ISSB would itch too far towards double materiality, UK, US, Japan, entire emerging market would stop supporting ISSB. So it's a very delicate, beautiful balance, and it will stay there. It will stay being a global baseline, and that's perfectly uh, fine. Now, the, the second reason I'm super relaxed about it is in the area of climate, and I think you alluded to this as well. It's not that easy to find the difference between financial and double materiality. The main risks for the main sectors are transitional risks. So the risk that suddenly government policy will lower the profitability, for instance, by introducing a CO2 price. Now, why is the CO2 price lowering your profitability as a company? It's because you have large emissions. How do you reduce that risk towards that is to lower your emissions. So there's a huge overlap between financial and double materiality in the area of climate. It, with biodiversity, it stops being as clear as that, but in the area of climate, I'm quite relaxed with that. Now, we are completely in Team Europe on this, on this side, having taken over the non-financial reporting directive in Switzerland by law, which has double materiality, and last year, the Federal Council has decided that we move towards adopting the CSRD um, on law level. It still gives us the flexibility to go down the road of ESRS or ISSB more purely with some additions, but that's uh, details for, for uh, next year. Okay, I want to stay with you, uh, Christoph, for a second, because you called it the year of pushback, and you went to Brazil to justify, I think we don't have to go this far, right? We have a lot of, we see this with executives in the classroom, we have a lot of companies of different sizes that talk about the cost of reporting, they talk about the burden, they talk about all the risks that they have to evaluate. So what is a good answer to those companies to also value opportunities? I think we, we need to always keep proportionality in mind. So not every disclosure regulation that fits to a large multinational company fits also to a small SME. They shouldn't have the same level of disclosures. And we also don't need to always be perfectly precise. Like, what's the goal? The goal is to trans have to have a successful transition, the biggest transition the economies, the global economies, have had in their history since the industrialization. We, yeah, it's really, we don't need to be perfect on precise disclosures. We need to have enough disclosures to have meaningful decision for the actors in the financial markets to to incentivize uh, or to to steer the capital to to those companies that are leaders in their sectors. I want to turn to, we talk a lot about the standards that are out there. So the ISSB published um, the first two standards. We have the European Union uh, publishing the standards. I'm interested in the process of coming to a standard, given how influential they are once they are on paper. So Caroline, can you speak to what is actually the standard development process um, to finally arrive at the product that we see published? from a demand. So there has to be the demand from state. It's all about change management. So you can't in, impose change on those people who don't want it. There was a demand for sustainability standards from the ISSB within the IFRS Foundation. So what, what happens when we had, you have to go and consult your stakeholders and you have to listen to what they say. So it, when the ISSB was formed, it was always going to be a climate first, but not climate only. And that was a very strong message that came through, not only from consultation, but also from our monitoring board, uh, which is run by IOSCO, which is Securities Dealers um, Organization. <clears throat> so what happens next? You go and find out what standards are in existence, so that's when TCFD, Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, that had or, was already in existence because that was the second message. Don't start from scratch, build on what is already out there. The structure of the TCFD was, was being promoted by many jurisdictions around the world based on that. And that was what we started from when we did our first Group of Five paper in, in 2020 and which then moved for the, the, through the different process. 
<clears throat> so specifically, there was something called a group of five paper with some of those organizations that Alessa put onto the um, slide beforehand. And that group of five paper, including GRI, published that first idea of how we might start to report on climate. We then, when it was announced that we were going to form the ISSB, we then worked with the IFRS Foundation, uh, and in their, in their words, you need to write this as a standard, and you don't know how to do that, but we do. <clears throat> so that meeting of minds between what the content should be and the structure of a standard um, is when the, what's called the Technical Readiness Working Group came together so that when the ISSB was actually formed, we could come out with an exposure draft relatively quickly. Now we're going through the process of, well, what next? So this general um, standard that we've come up with, what we're calling S1, was always going to be that kind of general guidance. In time, that will be then replaced by topic-specific standards with the industry guidance from the SASB standards, which was the US-based, I could go on, couldn't I? Sustainability <laughs> Accounting Standards Board um, industry guidance. So what am I saying here? That we have to listen to stakeholders. There has to be a demand. We have to listen to the responses that we're getting right now. And most of the stakeholders are coming through and saying you must work on the adoption of S1 and S2. If you're not getting jurisdictions adopting S1 and S2, you have a problem. <clears throat> then you need to work on more standards. And it seems logical that the biodiversity and the human capital is are the next steps, but how exactly we do that, you just can't do a biodiversity standard. And again, you don't start from scratch, you go into TNFD, which I support, <coughs> um, which is the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, which has now got pilot companies um, implementing the, the frameworks and recommendations there. So it doesn't start from nothing, there has to be a demand, there has to be this due process, which the IFRS Foundation is a stickler for. Trustees make sure we go through uh, the right due process. Everything has to be debated. All the board meetings are broadcast live. You can go into London and listen to the IASB or Frankfurt or Montreal or Beijing, wherever the ISSB is holding its board meetings. And only through that process do we develop standards? I imagine this is a bit different in the European Union, right? Because as a foundation, as the IFRS slash ISSB, I need to have a market demand. I guess the European Union has more of an agenda. Is that correct as a, a starting point to I, develop I, standards? I, ho I hope you book this room for the whole <laughs> afternoon. This is, this is how You have how uh, the story goes. one minute. Oh, I love it. Thank you. So generous. Uh, no, look, uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to explain it in a, in a very, very simple terms. But we cannot forget how the whole thing started. It was about tackling greenwashing in financial markets, right? So the, so the motivation to create the whole taxonomy system originated from uh, being able with clear conscience to say that my portfolio is indeed green, okay? And to do that, we came up, the, 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 the European Commission, the, there were two forces, the bottom-up force and, and, and top-bottom force. So the motivation was bottom-up, right? The financial markets, the NGOs, the companies, they wanted to have clear rules defining what is a sustainable portfolio and what is not. The bottom, the, the, the top-bottom approach was the pool coming from the regulatory European Commission that invested in the process. And the process looks as follows, right? First you want to create a system that defines what is, uh, what is sustainable, and this is what I more or less told you about, right? We, we're trying to analyze every revenue stream in every company that is subject to this regulation and define which percentage of this revenue is, let's say, sustainable to, to make things simple. But how do you define the criteria for sustainable process? Like, this is where what's extremely difficult, right? That's why the answer is, okay, we're going to create a group of 50 people and some of them will be coming from NGOs and environmental agencies. Some of them will be coming from industry and some of them will be scientists and some of them will be, will be regulators. And 
Let's take an example of cement, right? So who will decide about what does it mean to create a sustainable a cement in a sustainable way? It will be people from the cement industry. It will be scientists working on sustainable cement. And there will be regulators that will tell us like, okay, what is possible, what is not. So the key to the process was science-based criteria. That's a theory, of course, okay? Don't get me into the politics, but, but that's the theory. <laughs> a bunch of people working on a scientific evidence and trying to define the criteria that companies and financial markets will later use. And this is essentially what taxonomy is, right? It's a list of ac economic activities, and in each activity you will have a definition what does it mean to substantially contribute to, um, uh, to climate change mitigation in production or in transport, in marine transport, right? You can go there and you will have a definition. This definition exactly came up uh, out of this, this process. Was well, it more almost clear, a minute. <laughs> it was clear. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, so Christoph, I think um, once we start with the reporting and it's in place, we get a lot of standardized, great data uh, from company reporting that we don't have today on many things um, that speak to the transition um, that we need to go. How are you going to use this data? How is this going to inform the political process that we get new high quality data? So I think it's absolutely key that the data is comparable and decision useful and forward looking. So I think one of the key aspects to look out in the future of the data we want to see with these disclosure um, regulation is um, are coming from transition plans. So really, uh, it's a bit similar or complementary to what the EU is doing with the taxonomy, which is activity-based. They're also doing the transition plan level, and that's the part which I believe for Switzerland is of key importance, that companies, now that they're mandated to be net zero by 2050, show how they plan to transition to that 2050 goal and to have it in a way that you compare. So, so one of the developments internationally I'm most excited is the um, establishment at COP28 of the net zero data public utility. So an open source, open access data, sourcing all the transition plans of corporates and of financial institutions and compare it free of charge to be used by financial institutions for their products or by NGOs and academics. And that's a key uh, platform to monitor over time. Because I do think that um, at this stage, um, people should be fired if they think about creating new standards. It's time to implement and to compare the progress. It's now the time to really start uh, progressing along the plans that you're, to, you're publishing. And that's one of the areas we are working most towards to, um, from a government side. So Caroline, um, the standards are out there and now we need to implement, right? Um, and frankly, as somebody who has been trained as an accountant, when I read some of the standards and I get the questions from board members, how do we implement? Um, there's still a lot of anxiety that we can't respect the standard, that we make mistakes, etc. So I guess this uh, phase of implementation is very important. Do you provide any help? What are your thoughts on this very important step? That, that's a very good question. And there have been lots of questions. This is a very long standard. I'm an SME. Where on earth do I start? And there is not an SME standard planned for, for the, um, from the ISSB. What they've done is put in clauses within the standard, so you'll need an accountant to read it, of course. Um, so you, can, you don't need to disclose something if it, uh, it's called undue cost and effort. It's a phrase borrowed from accounting standards. So if it's going to be undue cost and effort, you don't need to disclose. And then you can, you can explain that. So they, there's kind of what you call reliefs within the, within the standard itself. Um, I'm just getting carried away here. So I think that there are lots of challenges. What we also have created that, that was launched just before Christmas at the last COP um, was what's called a knowledge hub. We've gathered together resources from a number of different organizations to help people think about where to start. There are uh, a number of guides that we're developing internally that will also help on where do, where do we start. Now, if I'm talking to any academics in the room, this is where I think academic research is really going to come into its own. We need case studies. We need research. 
we need to understand what those challenges are and where we need to come from to adapt to those, either through, eventually there will be um, an interpretations committee where we will evaluate whether the uh, standards need to be changed. We can't do that unless we know what's going on. There will be going out talking to companies that are adopting these standards and finding out from them what their challenges are, but we do need ac academic research on that as well. And that, that will help us in that, in that reinforcing process, making sure that the standards we put out there are fit for purpose. I hope that all my colleagues took notes. Uh, I'm excited about this. If, you, if, you, if, you're, if you're interested, if you want to talk to me, please, please reach out. So, David, I want to come back to perhaps the finance perspective and the data perspective. So we are getting this um, hopefully great data out there that is standardized and comparable. Um, what's the finance perspective on this and, and what about the just transition? Um, I know you work on, on the finance part and the energy part, so how is this going to be used? Well, it's, it's, it's a great question, and again, we, 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 we still don't know. I just want to mention one thing before I answer this question about the, the, the SMEs, be, be, because SMEs is a, it's a, it's a big topic and there's no clear answers, right? We all know that if we take a large, just to, just to give you an, an example that partially answers your question, we, we were talking to a large, uh, you know, one of the biggest European companies, and they have implemented EU taxonomy reporting on every stage, in every sector that they are present, in every process that they have internally. It costed them around 20 million euros to do, yeah. uh, which also involves, you know, big IT, etc. Those are not the, 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 the numbers that can be accepted by, by SMEs. Approach to SMEs is extremely Important, we cannot do it, uh, we need to do it right. We need to simplify it, and we need to make it easier for, for SMEs. But, but, but so, so I'm calling also for research in, uh, in, that, uh, in that direction. Now, going back to your, uh, to your question, how will companies use it? Well, well there are two things. One thing is, uh, you will know which company is sustainable and which is not. And that's, that is fine, that is quite clear. And this is the picture of today. You are sustainable, you let's say 80% of your revenue is sustainable, the rest um, is not, or 10%. So if you, the, the, where I find it most useful is in a case of a 10% company, right? So what the 10% company can do, it clearly is not sustainable today, but it can become more sustainable. And this is where you can use this framework to, um, to show the market that you, are, that, that you are different than company that is doing nothing. If you choose to have a transition path into sustainability, you can get CapEx, okay? That is meeting taxonomy criteria or is recognized in sustainable framework as sustainable, right? So you can issue, for example, a green bond uh, and you can get uh, so-called sustainable financing for your um, for your transition. And this is what we believe will really be a next big thing. And I know that we will be talking a little bit more, uh, more, more, uh, more about that. But I think that, um, that uh, raising capital for transition um, will be one of the, of the biggest usage of, of, this, of this framework. Okay, so basically channeling um, the money into those companies that either need to uh, accelerate yes. on the transition Ab or absolutely. that are already great. And, and it, it, it presents a clear map for an investor, right? I mean, you can finally d know what is sustainable and what is not according to clear rules that, are, uh, that, that you will later use and transform into your non-financial reporting. Okay, so question to, I think I include the panel. I, we covered a lot of questions, but I have tons here. So <laughs> this motivates the public. Perhaps one question. Um, we're going to report this data, yeah. and I can decide to not be 100% accurate or to make very strong assumptions about the reporting. What about the other side, the auditing, the potential punishment? Is there something that is coming up uh, in the Swiss setting? So the current law um, has no audit. That's one of the deficiencies. That's similar how NFRD was in, in the EU. A CSRD in the EU has now a, an assur assurance um, requirement as well. So if um, 
if the federal council decision from last year is implemented and the CSRD from a law perspective is taken over or the equivalent in Switzerland is being built, it would include then the assurance um, uh, aspect of it as well. So there's a lot of um, hope that the auditors will do the job and find out who's reporting well and who's not reporting well. Yes, again, and I'm sure there's, um, uh, there's imprecision again, but again, I do think that we need to not focus on perfect precision. It's really about um, uh, having a good idea on a company, having a general idea of the company is going, doing on good track um, to, to facilitate the transition. So auditing will massively improve the data quality, but I don't care if at the end it's 1% uh, of the emissions data, as long as we really uh, improve the data over, over the entire, across the entire markets. Right. So time is running down very fastly, so I probably ask you a closing question, not as the representatives of the institutions, but rather as um, family members, fathers, mothers, brothers. What's your hope with this really big change, the new era of sustainability reporting? Um, something that we can end on a positive note, what you think is going to change dramatically in 2024 and afterwards to the positive. And I think I'll let you pick who wants to answer first. So as a mother, as a grandmother, as, and in fact, it was the day my grandson was born, was the day I thought, you think beyond your own lifetime and you think about intergenerational, what is my grandson going to grow up in? What's the world going to be like when he grows up? And my, my hope is that the ISSB is, is one small part of that answer to make companies think think in a different way, to think about the way they run their businesses in a different way, that they are accountable for that, feel the responsibility, and change the way they operate to do that. That's, it's one small part. That, that's my hope. You need both the standards, the regulation, the implementation. You need the investors to be much more clued up and to ask all the right questions. So it has to be part of that, that whole circle. Thank that's, you. That's my hope. So I have two daughters, and I, first of all, I hope they don't need to learn all these abbreviations like ISSB, <laughs> TNFD, TCFD. I hope that we're beyond that in a couple of years. Um, but yeah. seriously, yeah, no, I agree. But uh, seriously, <laughs> I do th hope that uh, when they grow up, they, they see companies have transition plans that combine both climate and uh, nature, um, uh, to uh, towards nature alignment as well, and that the companies don't look at it from a compliance burden, but really from an economic opportunity, from a business opportunity side, so that we really create this race to the top that sparkles already in some industries or with some leaders you feel it already, but I would hope that the entire mass of companies look at it as an opportunity and not just as a burden. Yeah. Okay, I, I have a German Shepherd. So, so no, okay. you, you win over here, but, uh, uh, but, 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 but my hope is that, and, and I'm really excited about it, is that we, we will be able to use those frameworks to not only channel the money, the funds into sustainable companies in the EU or in Switzerland, but that we will be able to use this framework to channel the money to sustainable companies all over the world. This is something that we are working together with Sustainable Finance Geneva, a project called Swissox. We're trying to convince companies, sustainable companies from all over the world to use the frameworks that European investors are recognizing to, to simply put them on the map and transfer the money from uh, European American markets into the right, um, into the right companies. Uh, all over the world. So a tool to deploy the money where the impact is indeed. That's Wonderful. Great. So I think I'm, I'm leaving with a couple of, of learnings here that um, the debate about financial materiality and double materiality that we see in the press might not be as big as we see it when we actually adopt the standards. Um, big learning for me here. I also learned that um, there is a tremendous opportunity in the whole setting, why we focus a lot on cost, on the burden, but there is actually a way for competitive advantage, particularly by attracting investment and getting the good audit opinion out there. 
And I want to thank you very much also for the positive uh, vibes at the end, that this is a new era. This is something that can be very, very positive. So thank you very much. I hope we get a big round of applause for our panelists. And then it's good tradition at the annual summit um, of E4S to invite one of the younger voices, one of the students of our Master in Sustainable Management and Technology on stage to share his impression of the new landscape of regulation, but also of finance, which is probably where he puts the focus on. So I invite uh, David Campbell on stage to share your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Florian. Hey, everyone. I'm David. Um, great to be here to share some thoughts on sustainable finance. I guess E4S thought it was a good idea to invite a highly sleep-deprived student on stage after having had an exam this morning. But <laughs> um, No, but um, I'm honored to be able to, to represent the, the youth voice. And thank you for the organization. Thank you to the panelists for your really great insights on um, sustainable finance and sustainability reporting and frameworks in general. Um, we actually had a class this semester in the context of the master's program on sustainability um, accounting. And so we read through a bunch of sustainability reports from um, large corporations, and we really understood how difficult um, it is to put them together and then to interpret them. So super relevant topic. But during this class, I couldn't stop thinking, okay, we're making a lot of progress in how we disclose, but what are we doing with the actual financing? Where do we put the money? And so that's why I wanted to take a couple minutes to just talk about financing per se. Um, and yeah, so during my studies, I, I led a, a student-run venture capital fund called S2S Ventures. And although we didn't invest specifically in climate startups, um, I still learned a couple things about sustainable finance that I think apply to finance in general, so beyond venture capital. Also to other asset classes like fixed income, equity, bonds, real estate, etc. Um, and I thought I'd condense maybe some of these learnings and summarize them in three calls to action um, for investors. And by investors, I mean anyone who invests some money. So also people like you and me, because we invest through savings and and, um, and pensions. Also institutional investors, of course. The first call to action I have is. Um, Let's invest in young, climate-driven uh, ventures. It sounds maybe a bit simple and naively optimistic, um, but I think that the sort of systemic, large-scale transition that we need to tackle climate change has very similar characteristics to the internet disruption, um, which totally changed the way that we, we live as a, so as a society, and that was primarily venture-driven. Um, there's a huge funding gap in sustainability, which is something that the IPCC highlights as one of the major barriers um, to, to the transition in its 2022 uh, report. And Bloomberg actually calculated this gap and estimates that today we're only financing 16% of our actual climate needs. So why do I think that startups and young ventures are sort of uniquely positioned to close this gap? Well, it's because they're very agile and flexible, and they have this sort of unfair advantage of having this ability to pivot, which is paramount when um, the uncertainty is as high as it is with uh, climate change. Um, so my second call to action beyond investing in young ventures is go beyond software. Software is super attractive to investors because it's highly scalable. Um, but due to the, the, the physical nature of climate change, software alone can't save us. Um, one question I really like to, to think of is which emission areas are underfunded? Which emission areas are underfunded? And PwC actually um, estimated this and found that 75% of climate tech um, venture investments go to mobility and energy. But mobility and energy only rep represent 27% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So there's a proportionately significant lack of funding that go towards um, harder to abate industries, like, um, well, industry in general, um, agriculture or buildings. My third and last um, call to action is be comfortable with longer investment horizons. Investment horizons is like, like the, 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 
the, the, the time for which a fund is alive. Um, so typically, private equity and venture capital funds have investment horizons of around 10 years, and this is very difficult to reconcile with the types of projects that we need to actually tackle climate change. And by investing, um, uh, by adopting these longer uh, time horizons, we're able to deploy more capital in things like infrastructure, hardware, or deep tech, which is where the actual um, emissions reduction can happen. By infrastructure, I mean things like um, renewable energy generation and distribution. By hardware, I mean things like more efficient batteries. And by deep tech, I mean things like um, more sustainable chemicals and materials. So to summarize, if you're an investor, or if you know investors and thereby have the ability to influence them maybe, um, please invest in young climate-driven ventures, go beyond software, and adopt longer time horizons. With that, I hope I've given you some food for thought, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, everyone. You can uh, you take your seats, please. Thank you. And so this brings us to the end of our first block. But before we head off for the coffee break, I'd just like to take a minute to tell you about a project that we launched this year at E4S, which is our very first podcast. Oh, sorry. Perspectives. So Perspectives is about tackling today's big challenges with a cross-disciplinary approach. And to do so, each series um, interviews different experts with different backgrounds on the same topic. So we had the first series on the future of economic growth, a second series that looked at the energy transition, and now we have a new series coming out today with the first episode uh, with IMD professor Julia Binder, who maybe is in the room, but I'm not sure. Um, and it's about, guess what, ESG and impact reporting. So very related to what we're discussing today. But so you can, you can listen to the podcast on any platform of your choice, so Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc. But most importantly, we really want to bring you uh, content that matters to you. And that's why outside during the coffee break, you'll find a little pink box where you can vote for the next topics and guests uh, so we can give you the content that you want. And with that, I'll leave you for the coffee break. We'll be back at 3.30 for the second block. Thank you very much. Welcome back, everyone. Please take a seat. We're going to start our second block in a few minutes. Thank you. So, in our first block, we discussed the huge amount of work that's being done in reporting and regulation. As we've seen, 2024 will be a turning point in terms of how we measure business performance. But great companies will do more than just comply. The winners of tomorrow will be those who choose to see sustainability not just as a threat, but as an opportunity. Those who will place sustainability at the core of their strategy by implementing a purpose-driven governance. And that's what our second block is about. To kick it off, I'm really excited to introduce our next speaker. He's a professor of finance at the University of Lausanne and senior chair at the Swiss Finance Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, please, uh, please give a round of applause for Boris Nikolov. So thank you to the conference organizers for having me today. It's a real pleasure. I have a very limited amount of time to address the question that is, do firms uh, walk the talk? Uh, what are the promises and the delivered deliveries of uh, firms on the ESG 
engagement front. So there is a very large number of firm, institutional, governmental, and non-governmental uh, initiatives in support of ESG. Uh, those initiatives aim at providing an understanding on sustainability and ESG dimensions and support firms implementing uh, those issues in their decision processes and ownership policies. The signatories of those initiatives, in turn, engage into upholding the principles of the initiatives. One example of such initiative is the PRI, the Principles uh, uh, Responsible Investment Initiative, uh, that has gathered much attention. But there is proliferation of such initiatives, for example, the science-based targets, the Climate Action 100, and there is a series of UN-based net zero <coughs> initiatives. Now, uh, there is also a very large anecdotal evidence uh, uh, that is skepticism about uh, ESG, implementation e of ESG, and skepticism uh, leading to eventually uh, observation of greenwashing. So uh, to give you an example, uh, there is uh, uh, Deutsche Bank and DWS that have been investigated for misstating the amount of ESG assets they have on their uh, books. Uh, Goldman Sachs have been also fined for, loosely speaking, uh, greenwashing. And as a recent example, the Economist uh, offers a cover page simply stating ESG three letters that won't save uh, the world. So uh, there is uh, uh, backlash. There is concern about what ESG means, what ESG uh, is about. So the objective of my very limited uh, time that I have with you is to address two questions. Do firms walk the talk? But I would like to go one step further and address this question at a large scale, going beyond anecdotal evidence. I would like to show you evidence from the field. And more specifically and more importantly, I would like to uh, go one step further and address the question, does walking the talk actually result into effective change into material economic uh, impact? So let's start with uh, one initiative. This is the Business Roundtable Initiative, the BRT. Uh, the BRT in 2019 uh, stated that uh, the purpose of the corporation uh, will be now no longer a narrow concept of uh, merely adding value for shareholders. That would rather be something that is broader, geared towards all firm stakeholders, mainly, uh, namely shareholders, but also employees, suppliers, and so on and so on. So this has been uh, an important statement of uh, CEOs. I would like to address the question of does signing the BRT initiative result into any material effective uh, change. So um, I draw here evidence from uh, Ragunandan uh, showing that prior to uh, en enrolling with the initiative, there is no evidence of the signatories uh, observing embracing ESG uh, dimensions and objectives. More importantly, there is also evidence that after signing the initiative, there is no evidence of any material uh, impact. So from that perspective, this highly publicized BRT initiative, we observe that firms do not walk the talk. More concerningly, there is evidence that compared to uh, peers, the signatories of that initiative eventually uh, violate environmental laws more frequently. Uh, they exhibit higher emissions and so on. So far, uh, those firms do not walk the talk. Now, we can go one step further and examine corporate goals as stated by management into uh, shareholder letters. Well, what we observe is, for example, in the graph that is at the utmost left, is that there is proliferation of goals. We don't merely have shareholder value, but there is a large number of goals. And you can observe that those goals revolve around, uh, in the second graph, around adding value for shareholders, but also adding value for stakeholders and uh, for the society at large. What uh, we observe on that front, uh, in the shareholder letter specifically, is that there is evidence of firm engaging and creating uh, policies and programs to uphold those broader stakeholder objectives. 
Nonetheless, there is no evidence that embracing those broader objectives leads to material changes. So here, firms do walk the talk, but what we fail to observe is uh, real impact. Now, we can move now uh, to examine how institutional investors eventually do walk the talk or not from the perspective of the PRT initiative. It is a UN-supported uh, initiative uh, that defines six principles that uh, are geared towards understanding and facilitating the implementation of responsible uh, investment. The PR, uh, RI signatories commit to invest responsibly by incorporating those ESG uh, dimensions into their investment processes. This is one of the major initiatives uh, that has been founded in 2006. Uh, it has about 5,000 signatories and represent over 100 trillion of assets under management. That's one of the major uh, initiatives. So, uh, those signing the PRE uh, initiative result into any effective uh, change. So here the evidence is twofold. On one hand, uh, signatories that are outside of the US, there is evidence that uh, signatories exhibit higher ESG ratings compared to non-signatories. From that perspective, signatories outside the, of the US do walk the talk. Now, in the US, the evidence is uh, more nuanced. Signatories exhibit similar ratings to non-signatories. On that front, uh, firms do not walk the talk. More specifically, signatories exhibit lower ESG ratings uh, if they've underperformed recently, uh, if they have retail clients and joined the PR late. So here, why isn't the PR signatories um, status not a good indicator for responsible investment? Well, um, I don't have much time to go through the tentative explanations. I, I would like to put forward one particular dimension that is uh, the PRE status that drives fund flow. So there could be commercial uh, or more strategic reasons for signatories to embrace this initiative because there is evidence that such kind of PRI label drives fund flows and attracts novel investors. Now we can go one step beyond and look at the E dimension of ESG and raise the question how uh, or if institutional investors help green the planet or rather uh, just green their uh, portfolios. So here uh, we can look at institutional investors that join climate related initiatives uh, to decarbonize their portfolios. And uh, the focus is on particular on greenhouse uh, gas emissions. The two initiatives that uh, I've looked at are the Carbon Disclosure Project as well as the Climate Action 100 uh, initiatives. So here the two mechanisms through which those signatories could eventually generate impact is one through reweighting their portfolios or to rather engage into effective change within the corporations. The first mechanism is simply investing more into green companies, at the same time divesting from brown companies. Importantly, this only leads to reallocation of capital and reallocation of ownership of capital. This do does not necessarily translate into greener economy as a whole at the aggregate. The second alternative is targeted engagements. This means that signatories of those initiatives, they engage actively with the firm to implement change that results into real impact. So the evidence here is that most of the signatories of uh, those two initiatives engage with reweighting portfolios. They do green the portfolios. Uh, they do not act uh, actively to uh, engage into changes within the company. Now, moving further to uh, another uh, complementary dimension that is mutual funds, more particularly social responsible uh, funds. Such funds typically state that their objective is to select firms that exhibit SRI objectives. Also, a complementary objective would be to uh, engage with the firms in order to help them transition into more SRI uh, activities. Well, on that front, the uh, evidence is that SRI funds select firms 
with lower pollution, uh, higher board diversity, as well as a better work for safety. Uh, here we clearly observe that firms do walk the talk. However, we still are left with the concern that firms uh, walk the talk, but in the end of the aggregate, there is no uh, impact. Now, uh, there is also evidence of uh, green uh, window dressing, interestingly enough. Uh, we can say that the returns of a portfolio you can observe on a daily basis. The ESG disclosure requirements, you do so only at a quarterly basis. So what typically funds do in a very strategic way is to, uh, before disclosing ESG, uh, build up ESG exposure, and right after disclosure, reduce ESG exposure. This is uh, primarily driven by strategic reasons, commercial reasons to attract uh, fund flows. From that perspective, we can argue that uh, this activity uh, is simply greenwashing. Now, we can also look at the perspective of banks and uh, uh, ask the question, is uh, the banking activity helping transition to a, a more green economy? So the evidence here is uh, twofold. First, if you look at the self-reported status of banks in terms of ESG engagements, well, banks do not walk uh, the talk. Now, if you move forward and uh, focus on uh, banks that engage with uh, ESG initiatives, one example would be the science-based target initiative. Well, on that front, uh, the initiative is binding and uh, banks uh, do actually walk uh, the talk. So, I'm almost out of time, so let me uh, offer you some um, uh, concluding remarks. Uh, one important issue that has been put forward in the first part uh, of the, the, the afternoon today is that we have to be very careful on uh, ESG uh, measurement. There is evidence of divergence of ESG ratings, there is evidence of changes in the historical ratings, and there is also evidence that uh, ESG ratings are more geared towards the amount of ESG information that is disclosed by firms rather than the quality of the ESG information. So here, it is really necessary to uh, embrace standardized objective reporting as uh, promoted by the first panel so that we have uh, direct, clear uh, measures. So uh, to conclude, most firms have embraced ESG principles. There is evidence that firms have established processes to implement uh, ESG. There is also firms that uh, uh, there is also evidence that firms do walk uh, the talk, but there is also evidence of greenwashing. There is little evidence that walking the talk generates real uh, impact. Self-regulation does not work. Committing to uh, ESG initiatives sometimes does work, uh, does work. And finally, uh, as I've recommended by the first part, the first panel, uh, we really need science-based and economics-based uh, measurement of ESG, focusing on real outcomes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Boris. And without further ado, I'm going to call the next speaker, who's going to tell us about corporate law, and more specifically, how it can enable um, purpose-driven governance. He's already on stage. <laughs> He's an attorney at law and professor of business and corporate law at the University of Lausanne. Please give a round of applause for Jean-Luc Chenot. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to provide a tentative answer uh, to the question, which is, is corporate law the right tool to implement purpose, uh, governance purpose? Why does, why does a company exist? And who has the company to be run for? These two key questions relate to the social vision of a company have become, in, in words of others, uh, the hottest topic of corporate governance. However, we know since now decades uh, that they are debated since the premises of corporate law. And if the tenets of shareholder primacy prevailed 
over the last century, the financial crisis of 2008 give, gave a fresh impetus towards the stakeholder theory and a more inclusive corporate purpose. The trend is in particular linked to the development of numerous transnational initiatives in this field. A pile of agreements, standards, a jungle of labels have developed promoting the idea of a social pact among business and community. And this framework, this global framework has raised, raised stakeholder expectations to clarify consistency of the fiduciary duties of the board with sustainability consideration. In the realm of soft law, codes of governance evolved the same way. Most of them have expanded their recommendations from the so-called agency theory towards a long-term sustainability strategy. And even the very liberal Swiss code of best practice is reflecting now this wide development. Again, this backdrop, the concept of corporate purpose in its abstract meaning of raison d'être is promoted today by a number of prominent lawyers like Martin Lipton in the US who are advocating that this should be given a real legal scope. Though there had been little change in hard corporate law itself, most legal systems still provide that boards must act in the scope of the statutory gold and in the best interest of the company, such concept being broad and undefined. And to solve the contrast between the stakeholder and the shareholder model, a few countries have adopted specific legal, for, legal form or statutes to allow or to impose boards to give weight to the interests of other stakeholders. This is notably the case in the US, in Italy, and more recently in France with the Entreprise à Mission. Swiss corporate law is characterized by, and indeed also proud of, its liberalism and flexibility. Under Swiss law, the articles have to define the statutory goal of the company, which means the scope of its activity, but do not have to define for whose benefit and how to achieve it. And neither the law nor the case law requires boards to act exclusively in the interest of shareholders, nor does it deprive boards to do so if this is compliant with the interest of the company according to their business judgment. So the room of manner for, for, of company is very broad, and so it's also the discretion of the, bro the, of the board to create profits either at the expense of stakeholders or with full respect to their interests. And so Swiss commercial register do not object to the registration of B Corp articles, about 100 today, which give explicit way to other stakeholder interests. But Swiss law is also ambivalent. Ambivalent, first of all, because it's grounded on the Swiss federal constitution, which promotes sustainability as such. Second, a recent bill imposed to large companies an obligation of non-financial reporting, which will be published for the first time this year. And such regulation is explicitly based on the principle of double materiality, which will necessarily lead boards to set up a sustainability governance. And this regulation, we just heard that, will be soon aligned with EU regulation, especially CSRD, which aims to extend and harmonize standards, combat greenwashing, and offering stakeholders the means to hold companies accountable for their actions on ESG issues. Thirdly, this greater transparency creates a mounting pressure of stakeholders' expectations and as such a rise of compliance and litigation, litigation risks. And those risks have to be managed and challenge the scope of the fiduciary duties. And finally, the trend is mirrored in the best practices of corporate governance codes, which become a lens, actually, to give substance to the duty of care principle. 
So again, this backdrop, switch courts and scholars, which are called upon to develop law, should give a new color to the role of the board. Historically, the board has to fix the strategy, to allocate resources, and to manage risks. But in the context of challenges the world is facing today, it appears at least immoral, if not unlawful, for boards to simply ignore the stakeholders' expectations and the negative externalities of company. Therefore, board strategy should encompass this definition of the deep purpose of the company and question its ability to develop the business for the common good, or at least not to its detriment. And this go, goes far beyond the pure stylistic or even risk management exercise. It has to be supported by materiality assessment and reflected in a proper organization and culture inspired from the top. Boards are to be accountable even though stakeholders are not yet empowered with standing. That's the reason why, with my colleague Mathieu Blanc, we have proposed to adopt in Switzerland the concept of purpose judg judgment rule to replace the business judgment rule. This means that boards will keep their room of judgment, but in the scope of a genuine sustainability governance and not, and not just any short-term profit strategy, ignoring all uh, negative externalities. Should the legislator do more? The answer is yes, in my view. Even in a liberal system, legal framework is justified to support companies which are in need of guidelines and recognition. And this is the reason why, among other legal experts acting on behalf of the Alliance of Sustainable Enterprises, uh, we have proposed a not in status for sustainable enterprises in Switzerland, which is inspired by foreign legal models, but also by the objectives of the Agenda 2030. Among the goals of the project, which is globally to encourage the transition towards sustainability uh, for the economy, providing a framework to SMEs is a major one. Today, many Swiss SMEs, which make up 90% of the economic fabric, are faced with reporting requirements already, which are imposed by large companies on their suppliers. And they fear to be off market should they not comply with. It is therefore appropriate in our view to provide them with a Swiss made status of sustainability enterprise under very specific conditions. A parliamentary questioning has been filed by policymakers and the process is ongoing. So what are the requirements to get the status according to this bill? In essence, the following conditions. First one is adoption of a statutory commitment to integrate the risks, the impacts, and opportunity of ESG issues in the company's activities, which is a way to mirror the purpose in the law. Second, to adopt by the board, a program of very concrete and, to the extent possible, measurable actions on at least nine predefined SDGs. Third, setting priorities in the event of conflicts between the objectives. Fourth, make an assessment of achievement or progress on the targets to be reviewed by an external auditor. Failure to comply with these conditions will result in the loss of the status without any other explicit penalty. We consider that such a voluntary framework will provide both an incentive and a safe harbor for companies willing to act in favor of sustainability, avoiding the risk of greenwashing and the temptation of green hashing. So should policymakers go further and introduce a mandatory scheme for all companies along the lines of the Better Business Act proposal in the UK? I understand that certain poll polls revealed public support for such a reform last year. For my part, I prefer to stick with a pragmatic and liberalistic approach that relies on incentives 
rather than legal and stringent constraints and penalties. I'm convinced that the market will eventually depart good and bad companies. And so providing a voluntary framework to identify good ones would already be, in my view, a great step. Few takeaways in conclusion. First, no doubt that Swiss law today is flexible enough to allow boards to settle issues of who and why the company should act for. However, this flexibility hides a questionable ambivalence. In our today's world, the social interest of a company cannot be detrimental to the interests of society. And therefore, a deep and genuine purpose should be the DNA of the strategy and decision-making process of boards. And boards should be accountable in this respect. And to support these trends, I advocate, among others, for a voluntary and light regulation framing the status of a sustainable enterprise, especially for SMEs. Companies walking the talk should be able and proud to be vocal on their progress with the goal to expand the level playing field of better business. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean-Luc. Our next speaker just published a great book with the title Capitalism and Crisis, How to Fix Them. The back cover reads, quote, at the core of the problem is the key driver of capitalism, and that is profits, end quote. I don't know about you, but this really sparked my interest, and I can't wait to listen to his presentation. So, he's an emeritus professor at Oxford University. Please welcome Colin Meyer. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm talking about the most powerful engine that we've ever invented, capitalism. And I'm talking about the most important component of that engine. Business is one of the most important institutions in our lives. It clothes, feeds, and houses us. It employs us and it invests our savings. It's the source of economic prosperity, alleviation of poverty, and prosperity around the world. But at the same time, it's been a cause of growing environmental degradation, biodiversity loss, inequality, social exclusion, and mistrust. And in particular, it's been associated with this. This is an engram graph of the frequency of reference to the word crisis in the English language. And it shows, and deliberately I've omitted the scale because that's irrelevant, it's the time <laughs> movement that I'm talking about. It shows that there was a noticeable increase, understandably, in reference to the word crisis during the two world wars, then during the oil price crisis in the 1970s, and it's continued to increase into this century. And here's a similar thing for the word capitalism. And you can see that the word capitalism came into the English lexicon in the middle of the 19th century when there was first freedom of incorporation of business. It then grew in significance around the Great Depression and the stock market crash, and again during the oil price crisis increase, and has increased again in this century. But it's when you look at the juxtaposition of the two words together and an association of crisis and capitalism that one gets the most interesting picture. <laughs> Namely, that capitalism is associated with crises, in particular during the 
stock market crash and the Great Depression, and then again during the oil price crisis. But it has exploded over the last few years. And if you think that the word polycrisis is a post-pandemic invention, namely multiple crises, look at this. It, in fact, started at the beginning of the, this century, and it's exploded since then. And understandably, because since the start of the century, we've had the dot-com bubble burst, the financial crisis, the environmental crisis, the biodiversity loss crisis, the pandemic, the energy crisis, food crisis, inflation crisis. Crises are increasing in amplitude, frequency, and prevalence around the world. And they're going to increase much further in the future as AI and biotechnology, genetic engineering, take off and in particular interact with each other. The record of capitalism and business is a very mixed and increasingly problematic one. Why is that the case? The reason is the fuel that drives capitalism. Profit. Profit is both the source of the resource of business and the incentive that drives business. Without profit, there's no capital in capitalism. But we're misconceiving the notion of what a profit is. Profit derives from the Latin proficere, perfectus, to advance and progress. But too much of profit is not associated with either advancement or progress. And to understand why that's the case, one has to lift up the hood and look under the bonnet of capitalism at the engine below. And when you do that, this is what you see. You see that profit, as I've shown here in gray, is of course the difference between the revenue or the income of a company and its costs, namely its labor costs, its supply costs, its capital costs. And that is the measured profit as shown in gray. And gray is an appropriate color for this because it's not actually the profit of a firm. It's not a profit of a firm because it doesn't take account of the detriment that the firm causes to its employees by paying them less than a living wage, to their suppliers by not paying them a fair trade price, to the environment by polluting the environment but through biodiversity extinction and through global warming emissions. And in particular, companies are not paying the expenses required to avoid those detriments. And where those detriments do occur, cleaning up the mess. In other words, the reported costs are not the true costs of a company. And because they're not the true costs, that reported profit is not a fair or just profit. Indeed, Whenever a, a director of a company signs off their accounts as being a true and fair representation of their financial position, they're doing no such thing because they're not reporting the true cost of the business and they're not therefore reporting fair profits. Now, this isn't all a problem of an overstatement of profits. There's also an understatement because companies can't capture all of the benefits they're conferring, for example, in investing and training their employees, in investing in communities, in cleaning up the environment, they can't capture all of that in the revenue that they generate. But there's a difference between the overstatement and the understatement, because companies can incur the costs of avoiding the detriments they're causing and mitigating the effects that they have and clean up the mess but they can't simply dream up magically revenue for the benefits that they're conferring. They have to find ways of commercializing that and earning a revenue from doing that. Now, we think of this basically in terms of it being about externalities, that it's external or extrinsic to the firm. It's about 
the operation of the market, competition, regulation, taxation, reputation. But it's not. It's absolutely intrinsic, internal to the operation of a firm and the way in which a firm creates a profit. Now, in thinking about this, we have therefore, because we formulated the problem incorrectly, come up with the wrong policy prescriptions. Regulation fails because companies lobby from the inclusion of increased regulation. They employ consultants to find ways of getting around regulation and, if possible, turning it to a competitive advantage. And competition fails because good firms that do incur the true costs of their activities and therefore earn a just profit, cannot compete against those that do not, and therefore are earning a profit that's greater than that of the just profit that companies that are, earn, that are incurring the uh, true costs of their business. So competition, far from creating a run to the top of good firms driving up bad, does exactly the opposite. It encourages a run to the bottom because capital flows from the just profit to the measured profit, including the excess profits. In other words, we've got a Gresham law, essentially, of bad firms driving out the good. And reputation and the long term doesn't solve the problem either. Of course it's the case that we accept that companies earn substantial profits from uh, creating benefits for us. And we, we admire companies that do that. But what we find outrageous is when companies don't do that, when they're earning profits at our expense, as, for example, happened during the financial crisis, and in the case of the UK, Currently, water companies are earning vast profits from dumping untreated sewage into rivers, lakes, and seashores and paying their executives handsomely for that. Now, although there's a consensus around the fact that this is egregious behavior, there is no consensus around what to do about it. Because on the left, the socialist left, and the environmental activists, we have a view that we need more regulation, tougher regulation. And on the libertarian right and the anti-woke brigade, we have the view, no, 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 that's an infringement of our freedom and our liberty, and it destroys growth and jobs. So we cannot come up with a consensus about what to do about something that inherently everyone recognizes as being unacceptable. So long as it's the case that we think of the problem as simply being an externality, we're not going to solve the problem. We have to think about it in terms of how do we actually move from where we currently are of wading through the weeds of expropriation, exploitation, and unjust profit to surfing the waves of innovation, inspiration, and initiative to create just profits from true costs. We need to shift our vision and our objectives and ambitions from weeding in those waves to, from weeding in the, <laughs> wading in the weeds from, to surfing the waves. Now, if you do that, then two remarkable things happen. If one can get to determining what is the just profit of a company, two remarkable things happen. The first is that instead of competition creating runs to the bottom, it creates runs to the top. Because now it's the good firms that are not driven out by bad firms, but by better firms that are earning larger profits can find ways of commercializing the benefits, of delivering benefits for others, and thereby outcompeting other 
firms that are doing that. So competition then does what competition is supposed to do. And the second effect is that it creates an alignment of interest between business and the public sector in terms of creating public benefits and the not-for-profit sector in terms of creating social well-being and environmental well-being. And as a consequence, what then emerges is that one has business having a common purpose of creating shared prosperity in line with what both the public sector and the not-for-profit sectors are trying to do as well. And that then assists companies in being able to commercialize those profits that they should be earning, those just profit increments that I show there, from creating environmental benefits, social benefits, and things like that. Now, you might say, well, this is just academic dreaming. This is pie in the sky and wishful thinking. It's not hard-nosed practical reality. Well, I'm going to say to you, on the contrary, this is not only practically possible, it's practically happening now in various parts of the world and has been happening for some period of time. In 1936, Henry Wellcome left his company, not to his children or family, but in a foundation. And that foundation became known as the Wellcome Foundation, and it grew to become, today, the third largest charitable foundation in the world, known as the Wellcome Trust, which is a major funder of research into science and medicine in the UK and in other countries around the world. His company, the Wellcome Pharmaceutical Company, grew from 1936 until, in 1986, the Wellcome Foundation started to sell off, in its infinite wisdom, shares in the company, and in 1996, sold its last block of shares to Glaxo to form Glaxo Wellcome, that then merged with SmithKline Beecham to create GlaxoSmithKline, GSK, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world today. Now, that's a particularly interesting case because the Wellcome Pharmaceutical Company didn't just have a foundation. Lots of companies have foundations. But instead, the Wellcome Foundation actually owned the company. It's known as an enterprise foundation. Now, there's one country in the world that has a particular prevalence of these enterprise foundations. It so happens to be one of the most successful countries in the world with the highest levels of income per capita, lowest levels of inequality, best employee relations, and it's also one of the happiest countries in the world. And this year, it also was home to the company in Europe with the largest stock market capitalization of any European company. The country is Denmark. And what marks out Denmark is that 50% of the stock market value of its companies is accounted for by enterprise foundations, these companies that are owned and controlled by foundations. And the company with the largest stock market valuation is Nova Nordis, the pharmaceutical company that makes insulin used in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Now, not only is it the most valued company in Europe, the Novo Nordis Foundation, which owns or controls the Nova Nordis company, is the largest charitable foundation by assets under management in the world. Larger in value than the next two added together, the Bill and Gates 
Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the, uh, uh, the Welcome Foundation. Now, what this illustrates is exactly what I'm talking about, namely a company that sees as its purpose to surf the waves, to create value from creating benefits, not wading in the weeds of trying to profit from creating detriments for others. And what is also particularly interesting about Denmark is, to come back to Jean-Luc's uh, presentation, Denmark has, in some respects, one of the best corporate laws in the world, known as Enterprise Foundation Law. Well, that Enterprise Foundation Law, first of all, ensures that the foundations don't exploit their privileged position, but on the contrary, they promote the purpose of the founders in perpetuity not just for the 50 years that the Wellcome Foundation retained its shareholding in the Wellcome Company, but in perpetuity. Now, this is just one illustration of the types of ownership and legal structures that are doing exactly what I'm talking about. And there are many others around the world. And furthermore, this is not just about having the right legal structure and ownership of companies, but also about inspiring leadership, governance structures, finance, and in particular ways of measuring performance and accounting for it to ensure that one is measuring the true costs of a business and the just profit that they should be earning. Now, how should one do this? Where, is, where else is it being done? And when can it be done? Or where, when has it been done? Well, I'm afraid to say that I've run out of time. <laughs> and so all I can do is to ask that you read my book. <laughs> uh, and thank you. Thank you, Colin. I'm sorry, I'm going to sit here. So now we're going to start the Q&A session. Just like to remind the audience that you can still ask questions if you want to by scanning the QR code here or going to Slido and uh, with the hashtag Annual Summit. But maybe a first question that I want to ask the three of you to start. Uh, is how does this all connect with what we discussed in the first block? So, in other words, um, does the adoption of non-financial reporting contribute to the shift towards purpose-driven governance? Who would like to start? Well, not sure, because non-financial reporting is, is not a goal uh, as such. It's a journey, and uh, it can help the, the setting up of a real sustainability governance. But the reality today, uh, as far as I leave it, uh, is that this is experienced as a burdensome and tick-the-box exercise, which is often uh, uh, outsourced to consultants and this means that the inside skills are not developed in order to really create the content of the non-financial reporting. So it's, it's for sure an important step, but it's not enough as such, of course. I'm going in the same direction. Um, say that there are a number of issues with uh, measurement, as we have so far discussed and uh, uh, increase into better, more objective, uh, more accepted uh, reporting will only help into assessing what companies do uh, if they deliver on what they promise. So uh, I would uh, certainly see this as advancement. My response would be to point out 
what I thought was one of the most interesting elements of uh, the first session, and that was the observation that there's been backlash to this in terms of the company's response. There's been backlash to this in terms of the developing country's response. And that did not incorporate the political backlash uh, that there's been to much of this agenda, not only in the US, uh, but in many other places. There's, there's something wrong in terms of at least the way in which this is currently being perceived. And I think one of the problems is much of this discussion is incredibly opaque. It's very difficult for people to understand what is being discussed. And that's part of the objective that I've got behind what I was just saying. The simple assertion that companies should not profit from creating detriments is something that everyone can understand. And then it's a question of, well, how do you actually get there and how do you measure whether or not they're profiting from creating benefits, not detriments. And that's what I think needs to be a real driver behind everything that's being done in terms of the standardization and the regulatory approaches. I have a question here from the audience. Um, so I think it's directed to you, uh, Colin, which is, if the firm starts paying the true costs, potentially through taxation, how can we ensure that such higher costs are not passed on into consumers with higher prices? Okay, so that is exactly the point that I'm making. And that is that at, at the moment, the way in which we see this operating is that efficiency, that pricing appropriately, uh, is done in terms of the operation of a competitive market. And that competition is absolutely essential. And that the way to ensure that that happens is that the costing that companies incur reflects the true cost of what they're doing. So what we want to have is that consumers consume at the lowest price possible, but they're not benefiting from exporting problems to other people any more than companies are. So that what we want to have is that prices reflect these true costs of what I'm talking about, so that there are the correct allocation of resources. It doesn't then imply that uh, prices are going to go up. Indeed, it may well have the effect of doing exactly the opposite insofar as it's creating really innovative solutions to problems that customers face and doing so at the lowest possible cost. Thank you. We have another question from the audience. This time is for Jean-Luc Chenot. Um, so it's about your Swiss legal proposal that you mentioned. Does it include specific topics? Uh, and so the person mentions that it would be amazing for startups also. Well, the whole idea of this project is, uh, is to provide very concrete tools and uh, this idea to have a program which is uh, adopted by the board based on real uh, measurable uh, criteria is something which can use, be used by SMEs and by start startups, of course. It's exactly the same, the same approach. Uh, what's important is really the, the concrete aspect of the, of the bill. Uh, have, having targets which are measurable to the extent, maximum extent possible and to be, to be reviewed, to be audited. Uh, for SME and for startup, it's in my view the perfect tool to, to, to go ahead and just showing and sh that you make progress and showcasing by publishing uh, the report that you are on the right way. Yeah. One more question uh, to you this time, Boris. Um, so I've just done a podcast on ESG and before that I didn't understand anything about ESG expect <laughs> except that we have these three letters and it's related somehow to sustainability. And I think it's the, like the feeling that most people outside of academics and maybe people working in finance have. So how can we effectively, effectively measure different firms' alignments with their 
ESG initiatives from the outside? Well, a prerequisite for this would be to first have a correct and objective measure uh, of ESG activity within a firm. I think the current uh, metrics we have are not necessarily the right ones because they exhibit a number of failures. Uh, we need science-based, economics-based ESG metrics. Uh, we need metrics of ESG that are disaggregated at a very granular level. To give you an example, if a company divests a polluting plant, it may well score high on the E dimension of the metric, but it will score very poorly on the S dimension if this is associated with firing the employees of that plant. So we really need uh, metrics at the disaggregated level. And we also need to have uh, standardized objective uh, reporting frameworks uh, to have such uh, quality ESG metrics. Only then we will be able to effectively assess whether or not firms deliver on their promises of the ESGs. So I really see that the quality of the ESG measurement is a prerequisite of our ability mm -hmm. to measure the effectiveness of firms into implementing their policies. Thank you. We're running out of time, but I have one last question maybe one of you can answer. As you know, we have a lot of students in the room today. Uh, my question is, what advice would you give them to bring about those changes that we've been talking about in their own careers? Yeah? Okay, uh, I think that's a great question, and my response is the current student body should be extraordinarily optimistic about the future. And the reason is that precisely the changes that are needed to create what I'm talking about in shifting the whole system so that profit is aligned with creating benefits can come about with your assistance. And there are three changes that are really having a dramatic effect in assisting this. Technological changes. We can now measure the state of natural capital around the world to immense levels of detail through satellite information. We can now collect information on people's assessment as to whether or not they are being exploited, expropriated, with immense degrees of accuracy through social media. And we have got the mechanisms of determining precisely what's going on in the supply chain and what's going into each and every product and process through artificial intelligence and other information sources. And you, as the next generation, can really make sure that that information that's going to solve the problem is going to be effectively implemented, used by your companies, not that these are just nice tools out there that can be used, but those are the things that are really driving the measurement of what's going on in your companies and what's going on in those firms in which you are investing. And if that happens, you'll transform the world. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. We can remain on stage because speaking of students, we have another student coming now on stage to share her perspective on this topic. Please welcome Lara Hunziker. Now that we've heard so much about purpose-driven governance, I would like to share a personal story on purpose, and that maybe sheds a bit of different perspective on this topic. Because as many of you in here probably, I have a vision. A vision of a sustainable, environmentally and socially responsible future. But as highlighted quite strongly before, we're pretty far from being there right now. So a couple of years ago, I made it my purpose to change the world. But let's face it, it's pretty hard to change the world. But one thing I took away from my bachelor in physics is how to deal with hard problems. And one thing we used to do quite often when we tried to do hard math problems is we tried to take the big problem that we can solve and dissect it into smaller problems that we would then try to understand. So I set out on a journey to try and understand smaller parts of this big problem of how to impact the world. 
And one thing I found was that good intentions and purpose alone is not enough. And that might sound a bit discouraging, but I will end on a positive note. Because I found some of the things that I think are pretty important to have additional to purpose, and I would like to share them with you. The first subtopic that I got to explore was about collaboration. And that was when I joined the Fridays for Future movement for a couple months while I was studying. I saw so many people from different ages, different backgrounds, all united by one purpose, to reach our climate goals. So I thought, it must be super easy to collaborate, right? We all have the same goal. But I was astonished by how much energy got lost in conflicts, discussions, slamming doors and frustrations. And I realized that if we want to have an impact, we need to work with people. But when we work with people, conflicts are inevitable. So we need to learn how to deal with conflicts. We need to learn how to have conflicts in a way that are connecting and not separating. To have conflicts in a way where it's not about winning and imposing our views on someone else, but to include everyone's view in a new solution. So my learning number one is con um, purpose is not enough. We need to learn how to have conflicts. And I would like for you to take a moment for yourself and ask yourself, how do I react when someone disagrees with me? And what is the culture on conflict like in my company or my team? Because when I did that a couple years ago, I realized I was quite uncomfortable with conflict. So I started take, taking trainings and courses in nonviolent communication and conflict resolution. And I found that it profoundly changed the way I relate to myself, to others, and how I approach collaboration. The second sub-problem that I got to explore was about working environments and leadership. Because after my bachelor, I joined a startup. And the vision for this startup was to support people on solving humanity's problems by revolutionizing the way we think about problems and how we learn. So it was 100% aligned with my purpose. And I did learn a lot about myself, about how I think about problems. But what I also learned was just because I was aligned with the company's purpose, it was not enough. Because even if the vision for this company was clear, everything else was not. So we were exposed to changing expectations, unclear expectations, changing strategies. We would be fired one day due to a change in strategy and rehired the next. And I realized, if we want people to do good work, we need to provide them with an environment where they can do that. An environment where there's trust, where there's psychological safety. Where people can take care of their mental health and don't burn out. And we all have a responsibility to create these environments, but especially as leaders, we have a responsibility to give these environments to the team. So again, I would like to ask you, what do you need so you can do good work? What could your team need from you right now? Realizing that I have a lot to learn about leadership was one of the reasons why I signed up for the master's program in sustainable management and technology. And I learned many, many things here. But the main thing I would, li I would like to highlight is the third area that I got to explore, which was about different perspectives and humility. Because I got in contact with amazing people from all over the world. I got in contact with different perspectives on the world and how we live in it different perspectives on sustainability, what that actually means, and how we should prioritize it. And I realized that my views on the world are often quite, quite limited and heavily biased. That something that I would think is a beautiful solution would not survive 10 seconds in the reality of someone else. So I learned about humility. I learned to see the perspectives I don't have, the problems I don't see, and the biases I'm not aware of. And again, I would like to ask you, where in your work could you be biased? As I'm standing here now, I'm almost at the end of this master's. 
As David has mentioned before, we wrote our last exam this morning, and I will hand in my thesis in a couple months. But my journey is far from over. And even though I haven't figured out how to impact the world yet, I remain hopeful, because I'm convinced that if we have this purpose to guide us, and at the same time, we learn how to have conflicts, how to provide working environments where people can do good work, and if we are aware of our own limitations, then we can deal with the other obstacles that come across our path on our way to a more sustainable, environmentally and socially responsible future. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for all these inspiring speeches. We're getting to the end of this event, but we still have two fantastic speakers for the closing. Our next guest will remind us of something, an essential element to all the discussions that we've been having today. That is justice in the transition towards a sustainable economy. She's a professor of economics and public affairs at Princeton University. Please join me in welcoming Pascaline Dupa. All right, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here and for having me on the program. It's a great honor to share a few thoughts. Um, first, I should say I did not agree with the title I was given, a just transition. I decided to call it a just future because I'm not sure what a just transition is. Um, I think we need to think harder about how to get um, to a more just world. Um, and we have to transition not just to a greener economy, but also to um, a more just world. And those two things are very much linked. Um, because right now we face a most unjust situation in many uh, aspects, but with respect to climate change in particular, I think you all know that citizens uh, of higher income countries, and especially rich citizens among higher income countries, are responsible uh, for, uh, for climate change, are mostly responsible for the emissions that cause uh, global warming. But they are not the ones who are paying uh, the cost. It's citizens of poor countries, and especially poor citizens in poor countries, that are disproportionately hurt by global warming. So here, uh, this is a, the, the culprit side. And this is um, showing you the annual total CO2 emissions by world region on the left, and then the cumulative uh, CO2 emissions uh, since uh, 1751. Okay, so obviously there's a lot of um, kind of like guessing in, in putting the chart on the right together. But um, the one on the left, uh, which um, is looking at uh, annual total emission, shows obviously uh, the great differences uh, across parts of the world. And in particular, you may notice that Africa contributes a very, very small share of total emissions, even though it's 20% of um, the land mass uh, and 18% uh, of the population. 18% of the population of the world compared to just about 4% of the world population for the US, uh, which is uh, responsible for a much greater share of emissions. Okay? Uh, India, which is also 18% of the world population, um, emits a little bit more than Africa, but still way less than um, the US. China, which is also right about 18% of the world population, um, emits uh, you know, much more than, than India. But when we look at this, we have to think about not just who is uh, producing um, and emitting as a produce, we also think about who is consuming. Because production is not consumption. So if we attribute CO2 emissions to the end consumer, the picture looks a little bit different. So on the left, the two charts on the left, we produce what we had uh, you know, on, on, on here, um, looking at production, but what you look at, see on the right is when we attribute CO2 emissions based on consumption. And so here in particular, I want to highlight China, uh, which is 25% of emissions when it comes to production, but when you attribute it to, to the consumers, uh, it's only 10%, because as you know, a lot of what China produces has been uh, important, uh, imported in, you know, by the US or Europe or 
uh, other countries. And so, you know, here there is something important already to think about, which is like if we try to transition to a greener economy by consuming less, which is what um, is often um, suggested, um, there may actually be some consequences for poor countries that are growing out of producing stuff uh, for us. So in the last you know, two or three decades, hundreds of millions of people have risen out of poverty in China uh, thanks to China entering you know, the global economy and starting to produce a lot of stuff. And you know, in the last you know, two decades, it's been the case uh, for India. And so you know, reducing you know, consumption, um, you know, um, you know, reducing waste is probably a very good idea in any case, but you know, reducing consumption uh, you know, we have to think a little bit about the consequences it will have on countries that, that need to, 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 um, to have a, a market to, to grow. Um, now, on the cost side, I said that four, uh, four countries are facing the brunt of the cost. And this is one example. This is showing the distribution of costs in terms of additional days with more than 35 degrees Celsius. Um, that's estimates from the Climate uh, Impact Lab at UChicago. They look at by you know, the end of the 21st century under a moderate emission scenario. So it's a relatively optimistic scenario. Okay? And in that relative, relatively optimistic scenario, you already see that the parts of the world that are going to see uh, m more bad days in terms of extreme heat are the countries that are already um, you know, very hot, uh, right in, in the tropic. Uh, and in particular, to put some numbers on this figure, um, Switzerland, uh, lucky you, you're only going to get one more day okay, <laughs> of extreme heat. Uh, the US, not that bad, 16 days. But when we start going to the global south, Brazil is going to experience 39 more days, knowing that Brazil already has more of those extreme days um, than either Switzerland or the US. Uh, Thailand, 40 more days. Cote d'Ivoire, 52 days and Somalia 69 days. Okay, these are just examples, but overall, Sub-Saharan Africa as a continent is gonna be uh, you know, the worst impacted. Okay? Um, and so if you translate that into mortality, uh, it becomes very clear that those who are gonna pay uh, a dear cost of climate change uh, are those who are already poor. Uh, and in fact, you know, blue reflects a reduction in mortality. So some parts of the world will benefit from climate change in the sense that they will have less extreme cold days, and so fewer deaths from that. Um, so that's you know, the blue part. So you know, finally, living in Minnesota um, may not such, be such a bad idea. Uh, but but you know, the, 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 and the really uh, dramatic uh, part of this graph is that there are a number of countries where mortality from climate change um, is going to increase quite substantially. Uh, and you, know, you can see Somalia that I highlighted before with the 69 extra days of extreme heat, uh, but you know, essentially the entire global south is not blue on this map. They will see more death uh, because, um, because of climate change. Uh, now, not only will they get more days uh, of extreme heat, the, the, the ability to uh, not suffer from extreme heat is much reduced uh, in low-income contexts because uh, if you have more reliance on agriculture, which is uh, not only you're working outside, but on, on top of that you rely on, on, on crops doing well, and heat is not good for crops doing well, um, it's going to be, you know, a, a bad, uh, you know, more bad days of heat means uh, lower production. Um, and you also have less mitigating technologies, among them, you know, for example, uh, AC. Okay, so not only, you know, poor countries are getting more bad days, they also have less ability uh, to cope with it. And so in fact, you can see from these graphs um, that the um, impact of temperature on growth in low-income countries is uh, you know, clearly negative. So uh, if you see on the left uh, side, this uh, downward sloping line, meaning that the greater the change in temperature, uh, the lower, um, you know, the, the, the more negative the change in growth, that's among low-income countries, whereas on the right, if you look at high-income countries, uh, if anything, I mean, you don't see a, definitely don't see a downward um, sloping pattern. It's kind of flat. So rich countries are able to cope with an increase in temperature. Um, and so, so that's in terms of growth, but in terms of, of, of human um, health, this is also showing uh, the impact of daily temperature this time on uh, mortality. Okay? This is highlighting the US in blue versus uh, India in red. 
Okay? And what you see is that um, a very bad uh, hot day in the US does not lead to uh, more deaths, but it definitely leads to more deaths in India, which is just one example among, uh, among poor countries. And of note is the fact that if you look at this uh, in the US uh, in the 30s or in the 40s, for example, you had exactly the same situation, even worse than in India today. So it's not, it's, it used to be the case that you know, even in rich countries today, um, you know, 100 or 80 years ago, they would also suffer badly from heat, but thanks to technology, uh, you know, we are able to protect ourselves, which is not the case um, in, in low-income context. So we are, you know, here we face a, a dilemma, which is that you know, if all the poor uh, countries could um, vastly expand their access to AC systems, for example, uh, they would be better able to insulate themselves from uh, the, you know, health costs um, of, of extreme uh, temperatures. But obviously doing that uh, today would save lives, but it would uh, only worsen the problem uh, of climate change because you know, AC systems, uh, you know, many of them still use um, refrigerants that, that uh, emit uh, greenhouse gas. So, you know, we have to think about that. And in fact, you know, we have to think about the fact that some of the regulation has been put in place today, uh, planning to phase out, uh, uh, you know, some of these refrigerants uh, may make it even harder for poor countries to protect themselves. Okay, so there is um, this, you know, Kigali agreement that's planning for the phase out of HFCs uh, in, in, in uh, rich countries, you know, in, in 2019. So that already passed uh, and very quickly uh, coming up in China and 100 uh, other countries um, and you know the extent to which uh, that's going to prevent these countries to protect themselves is, is, is quite uh, important unless uh, we quickly uh, you know find um, AC technology that don't rely on greenhouse gas uh, emitting uh, solutions uh, at a price uh, that's affordable. So that you know brings me to this broader dilemma with that to reduce the negative impact of climate change we need to make sure that the poor are uh, resilient and able to, to withstand uh, the consequences of, of the worsening uh, environment. Um, and for that, we know that the best protection is actually to become non-poor. So, you know, for, um, which means, you know, accelerating growth in low-income countries is the best thing that we can do uh, to, to essentially prevent uh, the poor from suffering dramatically uh, from climate change. Um, and, and, you know, short of that, uh, you also want to help um, adapting to new conditions. So, you know, getting access to a different set of crops that are resistant to extreme heat or resistant to extreme other types of extreme weather. Um, you know, getting access to technologies to, uh, to, to reduce the temperature indoors, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But then obviously if we are going to say, okay, the way to help um, reduce the impact of climate change on the poor is to accelerate the growth of poor countries, um, then this, it seems to be um, in, in conflict with the idea that we want to reduce emissions. Um, and so for that, you know, you, you know, not only um, a lot of what we've been talking about today, which is transition to green economy and uh, uh, for high income countries, uh, but, but also kind of leapfrogging to the green, green economy for low income countries so that they can, you know, they can grow uh, without being as uh, damaging to the environment as you know, rich countries today have been over the course of their growth uh, the past 200 years. Um, but I think it's very important to keep se separate conceptually these two imperatives. So the first one is you know, funding for adaptation, um, which means essentially providing development assistance to help poor countries adapt to climate change and become as resilient as they can. Um, and I'm going to argue that there's a moral imperative for rich countries to, to pay for that because we are responsible for the situation. Uh, and then separately, funding for mitig mitigation uh, in low and middle-income countries. And here I'm going to argue that there can actually be some mutually uh, beneficial trade between high and low-income countries. Why? Because the cost of, um, you know, if you want to call it a transition uh, to a green economy, is actually lower often uh, in low-income context than in high-income context. In other words, it's cheaper um, to build green from, the, from, from scratch than to retrofit, okay? And so for low-income countries to uh, become green um, uh, or to grow green, I'm going to argue it's a responsibility of rich countries to pay for that uh, because they are um, you know, helping solve uh, a global problem. 
But first on adaptation, I think there's a strong moral imperative to uh, you know, sharing the burden of that adaptation among rich countries. And so you know, uh, poor countries should not be responsible for paying the cost of adapting to a situation they've not created. And so in this 2015 paper, uh, Chancel and Piketty have actually calculated for us uh, how much different countries should pay. Uh, and you can, you know, there are various strategies for how much you want to, uh, you know, bill in different countries. Uh, in all of these scenarios, North America uh, should be the primary, um, you know, uh, payer uh, for the cost of, um, of adaptation. So essentially providing assistance to, uh, to poor countries so that they can adapt, um, you know, depending on, 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 on uh, um, you know, on, on, yeah, on various assumptions, um, you know, the role of the, 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 the U.S. Um, in particular versus um, other, other countries is going to change, but the, the bottom line is that poor countries should not um, be expected to pay for any of that. Um, now for mitigation, so financing mitigation, uh, you know, there's a recent paper by Songwe et al. that estimates that it's going to be costing two trillion per year for low-income co uh, countries, excluding China, to meet their climate mitigation financing needs, okay, two trillion a year. And so, in, very recently, in December 2023, uh, Charles Kenny in a CGD blog wrote, uh, well, that's a lot of money, and so a reasonable reaction for the European countries would be to wait on the rich world to better get its act together, in particular by rolling out technologies that make a zero-carbon transition more affordable before investing so heavily themselves. So Kenny says, well, they should, you know, it's too expensive right now. They should, they should just wait. But, you know, we, you know, the world cannot afford um, for countries, um, for poor countries to wait. And I'm going uh, I'm, to, I'm trying to argue, and I hope I already convinced you that, you know, poor countries are not to blame for the problem. Um, and um, paying to solve it would impose large hardship on poor countries if we expected them to pay uh, their, their own way into a green economy. And so that means that rich countries should shoulder most of the cost of mitigating climate change. And so the good news is that actually the cost has been decreasing. So in many places now, power from uh, renewables is cheaper than uh, from uh, fossil fuels. And that's, uh, you know, in part because, uh, you know, renewables, if, you know, you don't have to pay for the input when you use solar energy or wind. Uh, you don't need to pay for the sun, you don't need to pay for the wind, you only have to pay for the technology. And as we expand um, uh, the scope and our economies of scale, uh, and we become, become better at doing this, and the technology gets better, uh, the price per unit goes down quite a bit. So it's actually quite remarkable how, you know, in just 10 years, the price of solar, for example, has completely uh, declined quite dramatically uh, in, in a way that's rarely seen for anything. So that's, that's the good news. Um, and essentially the idea that these technologies become cheaper uh, with increasing production, um, and so you get this, this virtual cycle. So it's getting cheaper and cheaper to be green, which is, which is, which is good. Um, but uh, you know, the, the, the important thing to think about is that it's especially cheap to do that um, if you're starting from scratch than if you have to, to retrofit. And so one point that uh, my colleague at uh, Princeton, Seema Chandran, and Rachel Glenester at Chicago have, put, uh, have, have made uh, in a recent uh, article is that you know, who pays need not coincide with where mitigation takes place. And you know, if you decrease um, you know, CO2 emission, um, you know, it, the, the, sorry, if, <laughs> um, the, 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 the benefit to the environment is the same whether you decrease emissions in the U.S. or in Uganda, okay? Um, and so you can uh, think about uh, doing the reduction in emissions uh, where it's going to be cheapest to do that. And as I said before, you know, many of the low-cost options are going to be in low-income countries because land and labor are going to be less expensive uh, in those contexts. Um, it's cheaper to build green than to retrofit. And Poor countries are also where we still have uh, a whole bunch of forests um, because uh, we, you know, th those countries have not been as aggressive as uh, North America or, or Europe has been over the past 150 years at, at, at cutting the trees. So um, you can have payment for ecosystems which you know, help prevent deforestation in low-income countries. Uh, that's something that you, know, you don't have forest left uh, often uh, to do that in, in uh, high-income countries, but you can do that in low-income countries. And so. Uh, that's just essentially paying people not to cut trees. And you have to, you can't just say, hey, you should not cut trees, you should be careful of the environment. Obviously, um, we all know there are you know, externalities that people are not internalizing. 
Uh, but most importantly, the cutting trees is a source of income for many people. That's how you can feed your family. So if I say you shouldn't cut the trees, I need to compensate you for that so that you can, you can still feed your family. Um, so you know, one inf very important point I want to say that when I say that medi medication financing should come from high-income countries, uh, it would be an absolute travesty if economic development, um, sorry, if, if uh, development aid was being cut out. So you don't want to say, okay, I'm paying for you to become green, so now I'm going to stop uh, sending development assistance. That would be just wrong. Uh, you just need to just send twice as, <laughs> as much money. Uh, some, you know, for uh, development assistance. Actually, pay three times, you know, some for development assistance. Uh, that's for, like, think of it as reparations for, you know, the history of uh, slavery and uh, colonization. Then development assistance for you know, adaptation uh, financing, and then uh, on top of that, uh, uh, mitigation financing. Okay, uh, and that's very important to think about that because you know the spending on climate change mitigation uh, in the low-income countries is different from the net transfer to that country. Okay, because you know, for example, if you if you pay uh, give money to a country to adopt solar, but they buy the solar. Uh, from you know another country, then uh, that also benefits the, the country that's been producing those stars. Um, and and again, you know, if you pay people for ecosystem uh, protection, uh, you know they are losing out um, the income source that they had from cutting the trees. And so, giving them money to not cut the trees shouldn't be thought of as um, you know aid. It's uh, uh, essentially just getting um, you know. Um, uh, you know, paying them for the service that they do for the environment. So uh, I, I have 10 seconds left, so let me conclude. Um, you know, uh, addressing climate change, let's be real, it's not going to be an engine of economic growth or job growth for low income countries, okay? Uh, because we are adding a constraint to an optimization problem, which is generate uh, economic growth, but with lower green gas house emissions. So we're going to make it even harder for poor countries, uh, you know, to grow by saying you have to do that in a green way, okay? Um, and we, so, so that's, let, let's not fool ourselves and think that this is an opportunity for, for low-income countries. Um, they need to be compensated for the damage caused by climate change, so that's adaptation financing, and on top of that, they need to be paid for the cost of mitigation efforts, so mitigation financing. And, you know, importantly, who pays need not coincide with where uh, mitigation takes place. Now, I hope that I've managed to convince you that I'm as passionate about this as Colin is about uh, uh, capitalism and crisis. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not as optimistic as he is uh, because we have had a very recent example where we had to get, get, get together collectively to deal with a global crisis, which was COVID. And in that uh, crisis, what we saw is that rich countries just ran for it and left poor countries behind when it came to you know, vaccines uh, and making them available uh, widely. Um, that did not happen. Uh, rich countries just grabbed uh, as many as they could. Um, and all the mechanisms we had to make sure that there was a supply of vaccines for poor countries just completely uh, unraveled. And so that makes me quite pessimistic that when we face a global uh, challenge, we are not yet able, we don't have any you know, global planner, global structures, uh, global um, you know, uh, mindsets uh, to do the right thing. So sharing my thoughts is, is my way of trying to uh, uh, you know, awaken a sense of responsibility. Uh, but I think we still have a, a ways to go. So sorry, I can't be more optimistic, but hopefully a miracle will happen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pascaline. And now to close this edition of the E4S Annual Summit, please join me in welcoming one of the key people who's been with us since the beginning of E4S. He's the president of EPFL. Please welcome Martin Vetterli. Thank you very much. This is super embarrassing because I came five minutes ago, right? And so I'm supposed to make the closing words for what looked like a very interesting program. Um, that's like un cheveu sur la soupe, we say in French. But I picked up a few things from the last speaker. Um, what you said about you know, paying for COVID and who gets the thing reminds me of a Coluche quote. Mieux vaut être riche et en bonne santé que pauvre et malade. And actually, that's exactly, uh, I think, the situation we are in with respect to this. Now, I happen to lead an institute of technology, so you're, ex you're going to expect that I'm going to tell you 
technology is going to fix everything, right? Because that's usually what we hear from technologists. And um, unfortunately, I'm a science optimist and a technology pessimist. Okay? Uh, <laughs> I'll explain a little bit. Well, one is an anecdote. I visit a friend who has a new, um, a new refrigerator. And he shows me the new refrigerator. He says, it's fantastic. It has all these glitzy, uh, you know, new features, right? And he shows me one in particular. This is a refrigerator, remember? Inside the refrigerator, there is a, li a little compartment which is heated so you can put uh, the butter inside because it's very annoying when the butter in the morning is so hard, right? <laughs> so I kid you not. I kid you not, right? So I saw this. So I go on the internet. I search. And truly, some engineers have taken patents on the idea of putting a heating compartment inside a refrigerator, right? OK, so that's why I'm a technology pessimist. I'm sorry. Um, I'm a science, uh, you know, a science optimist. Why? Because science never goes back. I mean, science advances. Sometimes it stays put, right? Sometimes it makes a little step you know, back, but then it always advances, right? Once you have understand gravity, it's not like somebody's going to, you know, in the marketing department explain, oh, you know, apples will go up from now on because we have an advertising campaign, right? <laughs> and, um, and that's why science, in the end, has to solve the problem, okay? But the science we, are, we have to deal with here is not, you know, I'm a sort of more on the natural science and physics and math side, which is very simple. You know, in math, you, you, you go on, you prove something. Once it's proven, somebody has, has reviewed it, it's done, right? In social sciences and humanities, it's much, much more complicated, right? Because very fundamental questions are asked in humanities. OK, what's the meaning of life? What are we doing here? And so on. Not, you know, is AI going to solve, you know, sell more products for one of the CAF farms? You know, it, you know, these are questions are thousands of years old. I'll come back to it at the very end. That's about humanities, right? And social sciences is a very intriguing science, but it's, you know, you could say it's statistical physics because it's, it's the interaction of seven, eight billion people who have to, you know, trade things and decide how to manage things and so on with laws and governance and so on. This is extremely complex, right? I mean, very simple complex system in physics, in statistical physics, you know, took the brightest minds to solve them like spin glasses, if you know about statistical physics, right? So social science is very intriguing, right? And that's the heart of social sciences is something which is called managing the commons, right? Because all, I mean, what I just heard, it's about managing the commons, right? So the atmosphere, the temperature, the global temperature, and all this, right? And <clears throat> of course, you all know the, the paper, which is now by now 52 or 3 years old, which is uh, about the commons. It was a paper in science. If you read it, it's written in a style of the 60s. You couldn't write like this today, OK? Um, but, you know, it puts a fish on the table that it's very difficult to actually manage the commons. It doesn't give really solutions. It in indicates many, many examples where managing the commons is very difficult. The positive side is that <clears throat> if you are around here in Switzerland, in the Swiss Alps, right, they had to manage a very simple common, which is the water resources, okay? And the people from the village sat down in the 15th century, wrote down the rules of managing the commons. I think the thing is from 1452. And um, a famous economist, Elinor Ostrom, actually studied this, got the Nobel Prize in economics for it, right? But you know what? I talked to an economist, of, a friend of mine, and he says, you know, she's not a real economist because she was actually, I think, a social a sociologist or whatever, right, by training. And, you know, she was the first woman to get uh, the Nobel Prize in economics. The second one you all know is Esther Duflo, also thinking about how managing complex systems, uh, societies, and so on, with incentives and true prices and so on. Okay, so this is to say this is a very hard problem, okay? Now, why are we doing what we are doing here together with my colleagues? I see, of course, the founding director, 
uh, my good friend uh, Jean, uh, Jean-Pierre Dantin, and you know my colleagues Michael Aclin, Jean-Philippe Bonardi, and uh, where is Frédéric Hermont? Yeah. Is Frédéric? Oh, yeah, go, okay, good. Now, wh- where are your bosses? Where is Frédéric Hermont? He was here, I don't know. <laughs> he was here, okay. He, he saw me coming, he ran away. Um, <laughs> and where is my good friend uh, Manzoni from, uh, from, from right here? Because we are in IMD, aren't we? Anyway, so here are three institutions. He also ran away. He'll be there for the apero, I'm sure. I, I know him. Um, okay, so now something very serious. We sat together years ago between three institutions that are in the same location, but that don't really talk to each other very much because there is no reason, right? You know academics, they they choose a silo, right? When you do a career, you look at a set of silos and then you pick one and then you dig very, very deep, right? And uh, so EPFL is an institute of technology, so we like to do natural sciences, engineering sciences, life sciences, AI, data science, all that stuff, right? Relatively simple, we understand, we can do. Um, Université de Lausanne, of course, is here, uh, mostly through HEC, the School of Economics. And IMD is here because it's a fantastic school of management, right, and of continuing education. And so we decided to sit together under the leadership of Jean-Pierre Dantin that we would do something together and do something that is impactful. Hey. Think of this, a university that thinks they should do something impactful. And impactful would only be if we really could put these very different species together to work together. Okay, and that's the idea behind enterprise for society. And and it's, okay, if I had to say, I'm about to finish my mandate and you could hear from my technology pessimism that it's about time that I move on, right? (laughs) Um, But I'm very proud of what we achieved with E4S. Okay, it's not just because I give the closing words for E4S, because I think it's the most original project we have done, and it's also the one that is most interdisciplinary and most difficult somewhere uh, because of these very different cultures. Okay? And I think what we have achieved is to put into a classroom engineers, geeks, okay, and uh, economists and managers to work together on real problems, which potentially actually address some of the issues we see here, right? But these issues are very, very challenging, and it's going to take generations to actually solve it. But so I'll finish with a 2,000-year-old quote, okay, because things haven't really changed so much, (laughs) except for the heating compartment in the refrigerator. (laughs) So Seneca, around the birth of Christ, it is not because things are difficult that we do not dare. It is because we do not dare that things are difficult. And that's why I'm very proud that we do this together with my colleagues from IMD and HSC. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of the speakers for today. Thank you for sharing this afternoon with us. Of course, a special mention to all of our partners who make this day and all of our projects possible. So thank you very much. And one last word, save the date for our next Sustainable Innovation Summit, which will take place on the 29th of October at EPFL at the Swiss Tech Convention Center in Lausanne. It's a great event. We have more than 600 participants last year, a great exhibition of more than 30 solutions. So you're really welcome. Save the date right now. And with this, the cocktail reception is, wa- is ready, is waiting for you outside. So just go, enjoy, have fun, and have a great night.